Hello, you're listening to a Talk of Spirit Anime Cast. My name is Andrew, and I'm joined here with Chris. Yo. Today's episode is our Fall 2023 Anime Season Reviews Part 2, right? I didn't miss a week, right? We're just we're yeah. out two. It's a part two. Two. Okay, good. Uh, we're going to go through a bunch more shows. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll finish this time. Doubt it. But hey, I can always dream. <laughs> But yeah, we're from our That's where you can go for all of our links, social media links, ways to get a hold of us, ways to support us, including Patreon, tips, links, all that kind of stuff. Greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate that it supports the channel. It means so much to us. Um, Happy New Year's to everybody. Um, if you're listening to this remotely close to the point it is posted. But uh, <laughs> definitely looking forward to another great year of anime. Spring's already looking crazy, Chris. See that Spice and Wolf is going to be spraying now? Yeah. <laughs> Spring, like a Mashoka Tensei, uh, Spice and Wolf. There's like two other big ones. I forget off the top of my head, but it's gonna it's gonna be a crazy, crazy uh, season. So I guess uh, winter is gonna be a pretty chill season <laughs> before it gets crazy again. I don't know. Maybe maybe all the shows that I'm not expecting much out of in in winter will turn out to be amazing, and I just don't know yet. Yeah, usually is what happens. Is that usually what happens? Because I think I, I think I had that feeling back last uh, winter. I don't know. No, I was pretty darn excited for a few shows, like Oni Mai and stuff. So, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get into that. But um, yeah, let, let's let's just jump into our fall season reviews. Get this stuff over with, so we can jump into the next season. Did you already watch the fluffy, fluff fluffy side guy? No. Really? I figured you'd be like. Screw everything else. I'm going to watch that real quick. <laughs> I, mean, I tried to find a couple of new shows, but they weren't popping up when I was looking. That's I, the I only new on, show. So, uh, yeah, I, I I I finished up a couple of shows this week. So, in another world with my fua fua fu is is what I call it. But yeah, what, okay, I got to figure out where we were at. We we did uh, we did that. Let's see, uh, what's our first our first show? Did you watch Demon Sword Excalibur yes. Academy? You did. Okay, we're starting off with that. <laughs> Uh, the Demon Sword Master of Excalibur Academy, or Seiken Gakuen no Makensukai. Uh, Maken this one is uh, running on a, running for 12 episodes, done by Passione, based off a light novel. Echi fantasy romance is the genres. Hence barely, why Chris watched it. Barely etchy. I noticed that too. I mean, like, I did not watch the whole thing. I watched, like, four episodes, and there was really the, only the the bathroom scene. And that was that was all I got. Yeah. I mean, yes, the whole like lifting the skirt thing was like a little bit, which I I typically like that kind of etchy, but yeah, it was much. Anyways, uh, what it basically covers, hopefully I got this memorized. Uh, you have the Dark Lord of this current setting, this fantasy world, and he is one of many other of these demon lord, dark lords, demon lords. I don't know. He's a demon general dude, and uh, the 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 heroes are mad, and they're done. They're sick of them, <laughs> so they're going around wiping them all out. He's like the last one left, and even though he wants to fight back, the, everybody tells him, "No, look, you got to get out of here. You got you got to you got to survive. You made that promise, right?" And he's like, yeah, you're right. So he runs off and puts himself into hibernation and to be basically resurrected at a later time. And at some point, jump forward in the future, this girl, uh, Rizalia, uh, Rizalia, sorry, I, I, I'm, wa I'm looking at names kind of sideways. <laughs> Rizalia and Regina, they come searching this particular ruins that he's in, do an investigation like their, their academy will allow them to go out and do searches of ruins. And they, Roselia, uh, Roselia ends up stumbling upon him inside of this gym. And she goes, oh, crap, I got to get you out of here. And she starts firing at the gym because he's stuck inside of it and thinks that it's a boy that's stuck there. And he's like, why the heck is she making all that noise? I'm going to bust out of here and kill her. Well, she ends up freeing him and frees him too early. It kind of gives the indication that he was a human before and then he was turned into a dark lord by this one lady who he made the promise to. Um, so now that he's, like, less powered than he was before... He's back to his old human body again. And so she's just treating him like this little boy that needs to be taken care of. But he's actually this dark lord deep inside. But yeah, they go to escape these... What are they called? The um, the voids. The voids. The voids are pretty much a new thing that he's never seen before. While he was asleep, pretty much mankind took over. And then over time, the voids started showing up in these particular locations. They later on start to investigate and find that they're all popping up where major battles happened in the past. But these voids show up and... Roselia saves his life, and then he's like, why would you save my life? But I'm, I have to pay you back now. So he doesn't, he doesn't, like, OP main character save her life by, like, resurrection spell or whatever. He literally just turns her into 
like one of his familiars, which ends up being a vampire queen. <laughs> he finds out later on. Uh, so, yeah, she technically died and he just turned her into an undead, an undead servant of her, of his. And then they leave the place. They take him back to this Excalibur, uh, Excalibur Academy, which is this big floating island. And it's like the last defensive points for humankind against the voids. And, yeah, he joins the Academy and starts to investigate the humans before figuring out what's going on with the voids and all that kind of stuff. And, yeah, pretty much making uh, res res Roselia, I don't know why I'm struggling with her name. Roselia, like her, his little, um, well, they also reveal the fact that they, they don't use magic and stuff like they used to, they used to do. What the new thing that humankind found is the holy sword power, which is like everybody, most everybody has like this potential to awaken a holy sword power. And if you do awaken it, then you automatically get admitted into the Excalibur Academy and then you fight for the humankind. If not, you're, you're not dealing with that, so... Yeah, your your thoughts on Demon Sword, Master of Excalibur Academy. This one is an odd one. Um, it it feels like it's bogged down in trying to make itself a lot bigger than it actually is. It's got a kind of a cool concept. Um, like Andrew had said, it, uh, Leonis is kind of this um, hero in the past who. Um, went to the goddess and the goddess talked him into um yeah he was wasn't he betrayed by the the humans the after, humans betrayed yeah. him and so and she kind of saved him or something like that and so he became a dark lord um but he he's he's a he's a different kind of dark lord that is special to this particular goddess um and the he makes the promise that Andrew had mentioned and then he uh jumps forward and all that stuff and now and now we're we're talking about how everything's changed there's a lot of setup involved with the with leonis kind of of course he is technically op um but he's trying to keep his his opness under wraps until he can find out what he's what he what's going on in the world basically we're gonna demonetize for that i don't know uh, i hate that <laughs> he's <laughs> op uh, and I know that YouTube's gonna pick it up and get angry at us. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. You know that the, the cloak caption probably picks it up as that they're like, oh, so he's saying the p word. No, just his his ma his ability to be op. <laughs> I almost said his massive. O <laughs> Anyways, I hate this. Um, uh... Why? Do, see, if you're a content creator weird. for a long time, you get a con you be a content creator for a long time, and you start to think like that. I'm sorry, like every word you're going, will that get seen as something? Will that get seen as something? Um, the other day, I said something. Um, uh, oh, yeah, I was doing my 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 skip content from a Shoko Tensei, and I said something to the effect of, uh, "The anime only fans will know this," and I'm like, <laughs> "It's gonna think that I'm talking about only fans, and it's gonna demonetize it for that." I hate that. That I think that it's like, gosh, I gotta re structure all the wording just because th those two words coming together picked up by the 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 system you're talking about this no i'm not talking about ludes anyways sorry your 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 thoughts on demon sword excalibur academy he's op yeah he's op but but he hides it uh in in mostly so that he can uh investigate the world and find out what's going on um i like the maid his his it, maid his maid uh, servant. Unfortunately, Sherry. they don't use her enough. And that's what I noticed. That's why I stopped watching. I'm bored of the show because there's not enough Sherry, and it's mostly just. Well, it was mostly about Ros Roselia that I noticed, and she's fine, but it was kind of like get the get like hit their little dorm, and they had like this this club. They're not a club. It's like their own little like militia, militia, and like a squad. They had a squad, and they have their own dorms for the squad, and they bring him in to be in part of that squad, and, okay, now let's meet each of the girls, like, this is this one. It, it, what, what I thought was most fascinating was, because, yes, this is a, like, a another reincarnated basic story, and they're OP from their previous life, and they're still OP in the new life, but everybody else is kind of reset. It does the same things, like, it's the same world question mark, but everything's different like the mechanics they use different spells and so it's that whole thing of like i use this spell but then the world uses this spell and there might be a tie-in between the two so it does like all the tropes that you would typically get from the reincarnate 
And I wasn't getting enough that felt fresh. The only thing that was really kind of refreshing to me was the setting. I thought it, like this nice little, almost like futuristic uh, type of setting. I like the the academy and whatnot, how that looked and everything. They had like motorcycles and everything like that. But outside of that, like I kind of was interested in the Holy Sword abilities because they talk about how like you can awaken it within yourself. Res uh, Roselia at the first didn't have it and she was trying to get it. And there was an expectation that she would. And then you start getting into each one of them and how each one of them is unique. And it's supposedly manifested as something that is connected to them somehow. Like, it manifests out of their personality or something like that. So, like, with Regina, she has this massive cannon. And you have uh, Elefini, or whatever her name is. She was where it was kind of getting really interesting because she used to be a offensive attacker. Like, she was in a party, and she used to be an offensive attacker with her holy sword. And then she lost her whole party. So her ability actually changed from being an offensive ability to suddenly all it did was monitor things. Like, it was a camera system. Like, you can examine... She used it to examine people and give them physicals and whatnot. And she used it to, like, you know, um, survey, survey areas and whatnot. I was like, okay, that's kind of interesting how emotionally she changed. And it seems like her holy sword changed with her. So that can kind of open the door to, yes, probably advance Roselia's ability. Like, eventually she gets so emotional, it suddenly becomes a massive sword or whatever that she uh, suddenly has. I thought that was kind of clever. Uh, but other than that, like, I don't know. It, it seemed like it wasn't really doing too much different. I think the one thing that was sort of intriguing me before I stopped watching it was that they were kind of indicating that the guy that he wanted to go out to beat the crap out of at the very beginning, I think he was supposedly, I think, in the bottom of the the island or something like that they were just going to investigate it um i was kind of interested to see how they but again that's another trope within the whole thing is them running into their old <laughs> their old buddies from the past and whatnot because they're still around or something like that kind of like uh uh the demon lord misfit at demon king academy where it's like he's going to academy and runs into people or something like that anyways sorry your review but yeah that <laughs> Sorry, your review. Sorry, um, person that actually watched the show. What's your <laughs> thoughts on this? Yeah, the uh, the 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 um, effectively where it was generally headed is where Andrew is pretty much pointing it is basically the heroes of old started becoming these void lords of the new, and so this becomes this kind of weird interplay between. Like I said, Le Leona's kind of trying to find out what's going on with the world. Why is it in the state that it's in is really kind of the more thing that it is, he's kind of shifted towards. Um, of course, while he's doing that, he's finding that these these old, uh, like I said, the old heroes are coming back as the Void Lords. And he's trying to figure out how the Void Lords kind of, or the Void and, and such as such kind of fits into this big bigger puzzle so like i said it's interesting but at the same time the characters don't really sell it um the 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 girls are are cute i i, I don't deny that and like andrew said sherry's is really cool but they don't use her enough so it's really she like shows up and he's like what did you find so far i found donuts <laughs> i found donuts i'm like good girl <laughs> she wants you to have a donut but yeah, it's it, it that and that's probably most of the reason why it kind of all in all it kind of just fell to to kind of just this mid level. It, it it had an interesting premise, but it really just does not ever really pick up. Mostly because the characters just don't sell it. They really don't. Also, Sherry does really really like his show to form. She was super happy to see his new form. So did anything happen with the guy that there was one of them that had there was one guy that had um he his holy sword was the ability to control other people. So he had like this massive controlled harem of girls around him that he was just touching and stuff and and doing whatever he wanted to with them and they couldn't do anything about it. And it's like why is this school okay with I mean I understand the idea that this is his ability and he can use it against you know the voids and that maybe that's their whole concern so they let him do whatever he wants. I think they also imply that his father was like the leader of the a chairman or something of the the academy, which allows him to get away with everything, of course. But it was like this whole thing where Roselia Rez beats him. Spoiler, sorry, because <laughs> you know that was never going to happen. Roselia beats him and and breaks his sword, and all the girls get released. And I'm like, oh wow, I can't wait for what what are these girls going to do? Like, I immediately my mind went to, I can't wait to see what these girls do to this guy. Cut scene. 
I, I, I wanted to see how, what, are, are they, like, holy crap, where am I? Why am I suddenly two years older or whatever? Because I've been following him around for the last two years of my life, not even able to do anything. Nothing happens from that. And I'm like, I, I'm not like I needed to do something, but I would like to have at least had some sort of punchline to that because it seems pretty screwed up. <laughs> like, I don't know. I like, I guess, again, the families and everybody don't care because, you know, as long as he's producing results against the voids. For, anyways, never yeah. see him again after that scene. Yep. I'm guessing, yeah, I figured he just kind of disappears. Or becomes comedy relief for the rest of the, the show. He he can't control anybody anymore, so he gets kicked out of the academy. Becomes, a, I don't know, a, a fry cook or something. <laughs> they just they go on a date, though, with Ray Leonis, and he's over there as a fry cook. I don't know. Anyways, that's just, um, is that it? The Demon Sword Master of Excalibur, Excalibur Academy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm glad, glad I didn't miss him much. Kami Arabe, God App. Did you finish that one, or were you watching no. it? No? I never did get back to it. Kami Arabe, God App. Uh, this one uh, was done by Unend. I think it was like 12 or 13 episodes. It's an original by, uh, yes, Yoko Taro, the creator of Near Automata. Uh, series composition by Jin, who did Listeners, and we also have the director that was behind Godzilla, Blamu, and Ajin, so somebody from the uh, uh, Polygon Pictures crew is what it would be. But yeah, this one uh, follows a guy named Goro Ono, and at the very beginning, Goro is seemed like a normal high school kid going to school and everything. He's got this one guy that's kind of a little weird, uh, uh, Yutaka, who's his friend. And at some point, he goes to the roof of the school, and his friend basically says, "Hey, take this camera and and you know film me." And he jumps off the side of the the school building, but then he's like on this cliff underneath it. And then later on, they actually post that on the internet, and then he gets in trouble for it. Uh, but anyways, at some point, he gets this message on his phone that's saying, "You know, uh, make your wish, and it'll come true, or whatever." And he's like, "Oh, this is spyware, or whatever. Get off my phone. All right, I'll, I'll give you a wish." I want to do something naughty with uh, Sawa, which is one of his – this girl that's in his school that he has a crush on. And, uh, yeah, after he gets in trouble for the whole video, she feels bad because he. the reason that he thinks that it was posted on the internet was because he she was having him show her how to function a social media site. And he was showing her how to upload stuff. I don't know how you would type out everything like man jumps off side of building and all that kind of stuff. I think that was something they never explained, but whatever. But anyways, uh, she thinks that he it, he's in trouble because she was having him help her out. So she feels really bad about it. And then his friend, <laughs> who he had film him, was like, yeah, he's feeling real bad, but he's he's keeping it to himself. And so he kind of tries to get the two of them to, like, leave together. Like, he's he's being a good wingman. So, yeah, uh, Ono and Sawa, they end up going to this hangout place that he and his friends kind of go to. And they get there, and... She, and he starts to turn on the a game system, but it's like prawns on the screen. And then she asks him if he wants to do something that's on that prawn. And he suddenly drops his pants and starts uh, yanking his chain and fulfills his wish because he wanted to do something etchy with her. <laughs> and this congratulations, this little pixie girl comes flying out of his face and says, oh, congratulations, you got your naughty moment with her. Um, but yeah, he suddenly has been enlisted into a death game. So yeah, they, they, that was his, every single person that's within this death game gets a, uh, an app that asks them what their wish is and they get that wish granted and they become a contestant to become the next God. So they all fight to the death until one is remaining and that person becomes God. Uh, yeah, it turns out Sawa is one of the contestants and she's got this big knife that she stabs into Rami or any meat, human too, any flesh, and it becomes a massive sword. Um, you have other powers like the ability to see foreign time, creating gases, so so, far, so on and so forth. But yeah, um, it thus begins Ono's attempt to survive because he doesn't, of course, doesn't want to fight because he's the main character of a death game because they don't they don't typically want to fight, but uh, he's kind of forced to. The oddity that comes with Ono is that his his ability is to manipulate karma. So he can essentially give somebody a massive amount of bad karma. Like the very first fight, he literally is pushed the corner. So he decides to use his ability. This book comes out. It starts to put forth this karma upon his target. And this massive like debris from a satellite plunges from space and impales the person. (laughs) 
<laughs> like out of nowhere, so much bad karma that space debris just comes down and kills him instantaneously. Um, but then it has, a, has this other side effect because he doesn't want to fight. Obviously, it turns into this whole thing where soft spoilers after the fir- in the first episode, he essentially pulls so much bad karma upon himself that it re- that it creates a miracle to relieve the other person of their death. So, yes, this person gets impaled, and he pulls all this bad karma back from them, lets them essentially not have died, and then he gets a lot of that bad karma. So it kind of jumps scene to the very end, and he's at his house, and it's graffitied all over the walls saying, you know, you know, repent for what you've done, and his mother's become an alcoholic. It looked like she was a day trader before, and now she's suddenly an alcoholic that hates him, and... It's just like all this bad stuff has been placed upon him because he wanted that person to survive. He took that a karma upon himself. That was an interesting twist to the first episode that I'm like, okay, this is this is Yoko Taro. I'm kind of interested to see where this goes from here. It never really played off that again until like way, way later. For the most part, the show just kind of turns into what you would typically get from a uh, a death game type of thing where it's just a lot of back and forth between if somebody is going to uh, join somebody else? Is somebody going to double-cross somebody? Do you ally with this person? Obviously, this little pixie that is following Ono around, which is he, it seems like he's the only one that does have sort of a mascot character that's with him. It seems to obviously try to keep pushing upon him. No, you can't ally with these people, because in the end, you have to kill them. Like, no matter what, this is a death game, and only one person can stand, so obviously these people have to die. And if you don't kill them, eventually they're going to want to kill you because otherwise the game never ends and they never never become the god themselves. Um, this is never going to end kind of situation. So it kind of made that whole thing, your typical death game type of stuff, kind of play out. Um, that said, I, I think it's one of the more enj- – it's definitely a lot more enjoyable than most death game type of stories because I, I think there's a there's a weirdness about it, I guess is the thing. I, I, I joked – I was doing my um, tier list. I'm not sure if you've seen it. I was doing my tier list for the fall season, and when I was going through it, or maybe it was for the for the end of the year, I made a sec. I made a segment called, uh, or a section in the tier list called Cross Ange, because that's yeah. my final thoughts. Of, I would, of God I would definitely put it in the Cross Ange. <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like, I like this. It's weird, but at the same time, I can't really say that it's a great show. Like it's not. It's not doing enough that's unique other than the fact that it's just kind of weird. And for sure the ending is total Yoko Taro. Like I, 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 he is, I don't know what the hell happened. Like it's, it's one of those endings like, okay, it's supposed to get another season. Um, so I mean, I only, I got, I got a decent, uh, way into it. I, I, and it, did you get to the idol at least? Yeah, I, I I got past the <laughs> idol. I got to where he first meets uh, Sawa and the idol, or no, Sawa and uh, Chika uh, become uh, allied per se. If you yeah, that to, was a little weird. Okay, and about there is when I the the last part that I'd seen, and it was so the the uh, there so was you the got introduction to see, you got to, to see the, Sawa's backstory, which I thought that yes. was kind of a decent episode as well. That was that was probably the strongest part of the show. Yeah, uh, I do think that I do think the last um, the last two individuals they introduce because they because after that they get into the yeah what do we call our Gato? She's just like this girl that likes to um, she's a call girl basically. She's like perfectly fine with just going out and doing things with guys. Um, they they get into her and then right after that they get into the girl in the wheelchair, which Ch- right. uh, Chica was constantly trying to. It obviously seemed like Chica knew her. And there was this other individual that was with the girl with the wheelchair. And they get into their story, which I think that was probably, besides Sawa's story, probably the uh, the most interesting kind of twist to the whole story. Because it gets into those two individuals and what their power is, which I thought was really kind of clever. Because they're essentially siblings. And it gets into the father and what he was doing. And then how that all played into... Um, the overall story with the with the god the god uh, the god fight. So yeah, there there is a there's a few good stories in there. I I will I will have to admit that besides like the the WTF of the idol segment, the um again how much I I think Sawa's story was decent. Chica was okay. 
and the two siblings at the very end, I think were like the the strongest parts of the show. But I do have to admit that like everything else, like even with um Koki and um the other guy that was his friend, that whole story was kind of blah. Uh I even think Yutaka's whole thing was it didn't hit. Like it should have, like this bestest bro of him, but it didn't hit. Like it, it that I think that part didn't really land. It felt too cheap, I guess. Is the best. It was like it didn't when have you have That's when he fact. has when he has the when his power is this. That's typically what they do with it. That usually is what it always turns into. I looked at all the possibilities. This was the best one. That's what it always is. What it always it kind of turns into. And when it, when he said that line, when he said the I looked at all possibilities and this was the best one, I was like. Heard that one. <laughs> Could have done something unique with this, but you didn't. You did that line. Um, it was fine, but yeah, it was kind of the weakest part of it. It was. It, it definitely didn't have a payoff. That's for a fact. I will not argue with that. They. It, it was. My biggest disappointment, and I think we talked about this in the first impressions. My dig- my, my biggest disappointment is that I felt like they were going to play off the wish a little bit more than they did. Like, yeah, you can probably assume like. Sawas makes sense. Um, Akitsu's kind of makes sense. Where what we were saying early on was that there was this idea that each one of their powers may be based off of what situation they were going to, going through at the time. I thought that was might be some sort of psychological thing. Like Sawa, obviously, she has a knife and she stabs it into raw meat. And what was her story? <laughs> yeah, she was probably hungry. <laughs> so maybe that ties in with that question mark. Was it Carnage or something like that was her? Carnival or Carnage or something like that was her name? Uh, Carnival was her her, her ability. Um, Ono, yes. He kind of had a bad situation happen with him and Akatsu, and maybe that has something to do with um, Karma. He, had, he has bad Karma, which they kind of, towards the later part, kind of insinuate something a little bit more out of the, the powers that he has, so that could turn into something of a bigger plot line in the second season. Um, yeah, f- Obviously, Futuna is tied in with their psychological st- uh, state at the current time. So I, I guess they technically, I, I guess the only one they didn't really get into that with really was um, Ama and and um, Chica. I think those are the only two that didn't well, really have Ama's sort of power, tie in. Ama's power is not his, right? He kind of took it, anyways. Um, yeah, and I guess the other girls, the whole tap dancing, teleportation, go wherever. It's it has to do with uh, video and. Maybe she likes to record herself doing her business. <laughs> the prawn turned on the television again. Nope, that's actually her. Um, so I guess it does kind of connect, but I thought it would be a little more interesting than that. Maybe I, maybe I was kind of expecting it to be a little bit more obvious, I guess, is the best way to put it. But, yeah. In the end, it was a it was a solid death game show. It, yes, it is fully CGI. It is a, it's a different studio than usual for the CGI. I think they did a pretty solid job i think it had a very unique style to it um it didn't look terrible i mean there was a stiffness to the animation at times especially when they're running down hallways <laughs> that stuff looked bad but for the most part it looked good and i think they had a great kind of style to it like especially whenever they go into the like it, there's like some certain like battle arena type thing they kind of lay out sometimes that i thought was kind of unique in design that they were doing there and the music was was fantastic. I think the yeah the musician I think did uh, near as well. So they had some really great musical tracks in there that were pretty fantastic. So it had a great team behind it. I, I think the only thing that kind of stuck in my mind was hearing that uh, apparently Yokotaro had to kind of reel it back a little bit. I'm not sure if that was meaning that he wanted it longer than what they were going to give him time for for the series, and so they told him to kind of chill out on his writing uh, because I can I know that he can write a lot. <laughs> Here apparently has a lot in it, um, so maybe they just told him to re- reel back the writing. Or I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think I don't think they necessarily told him to not, I guess, get crazier. Which that was my fear that they might have they might have held back quite a bit because of some reason, maybe TV or whatever. But yeah, it's it was a it turned out to be a really solid series. Um, just not incredible. It's not like I I tell anybody to go either way for it. But if you're looking for death games and like I said, this is probably one of the <clears throat> probably one of the better death games that I've run into, so it's good. It's good. God app Kamerabe. 
God app. <sighs> got his wish. <laughs> He's got his wish. Uh, did we do spy? We did a spy family already. Yeah, we did a spy family. Um, I didn't finish. Did you finish Shy? No, I want to. I never started it. There's another season, so that makes me want to over finish it more now. What about uh, Stardust Telepath? Didn't get past the uh, tool lady. The tool lady? The nope. Sundere? <laughs> uh, yeah, Stardust Telepath. This was on uh, Crunchyroll. I think it ran for 12 episodes. I think it was 12 episodes. Uh, done by Studio Gokumi. Uh, the source is a manga. Comedy slice of life. And yeah, this one opens up with Umika. And Umika is... An, it's, she's an, a, a, a Tori Bochi. She's a Bochi des. She's one of those types that can't speak out. She's she has a lot of trouble vocalizing. She's very, I don't want to say introvert, but she's kind of in that same kind of realm. I guess it would technically be classified as introvert. Uh, but yeah, she's she's always wanted to communicate to people, but she can't communicate to people. She just struggles with speaking. And she looked into a lot of like alien stuff like that. And so she figured, okay, the best the best people for me to hang out with because I can't speak is aliens because they can read minds. And so she dreams one day that she'll meet an alien or she can just be taken off into space and just leave this world because she can't communicate to us. She'd probably be able to communicate to them. Well, one day, a girl named Yu Akichi uh, shows up and she proclaims to be an alien. <laughs> so <laughs> her wish comes true. An alien shows up. Um, later on, she kind of explains that, yeah, she's an alien that was... She crashed her ship there, lost her memories, doesn't remember what her mission is. So she's going to try to figure out what humans are all about until she figures out what happened and she can leave the planet. And so Umika, now having met an alien, tries really hard to speak to you because she finally found an alien. Th this girl is, like, so into it. She knows, like, the full dictionary of, like, of 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 alien speech. Like, she's read this whole novel and mem memorized it. <laughs> So she's going around and doing, like, alien talk to greet to people and everything like that. Um, well, yeah. Uh, what happens is, essentially, Umika tells you, hey, look, I really want to go out into space as well. Um, take me with you kind of thing. Let's build a rocket together. They make a club together. Um, this club is to make little model rockets and shoot them off and then hope that one day they can build a bigger one enough that they can get off the planet and... They have a club where is where you pretty much makes her way of uh, sh you like <laughs> just breaks into a, a local lighthouse and starts living there. And so they have their club there. And then it just so happens this Haruno girl is like, oh, yeah, I know what this place is. Like, apparently her dad owned the lighthouse. So she gets them a key for it. Like, yeah, you broke into my my parents uh, lighthouse. Let me get you a key to it so you can actually lock the door. <laughs> and there's a club downstairs, a little downstairs that we can hang out in. And yeah, later on, they, they need the help of um, uh, Matataki, who's like this engineer girl, to like help them build bigger and gunpowder-based uh, rockets. And they go to competitions, and it kind of gets into this whole thing where each one of them has sort of a difficulty growing through. Like I said before, Umika just struggles with self-confidence and the ability to speak out. Um, you have... Haruno, who has her own difficulties, and Matataki, who has her own difficulties. And it's kind of them self-discovery and, and kind of supporting each other and helping each other get through situations and having a lot of spouts. <laughs> and having, having, a lot of, uh, having a lot of spouts that they have to get through. Um, but yeah, that's, 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 the, that's the story. At least not spoilery. Um, I'm, I'm of two minds this series... On one hand, I, I find Umika's story to be just adorable. She, like I said earlier, she's a Hattori Bochi. She is the Bochi des. You want to support her. You want to see her smile. You're you're sitting there rooting for her because they really nailed her timidness and her fears. And the Seiyu did a fantastic job of portraying her just struggling, just constantly, just stuttering and trying to get her words out. Um, Yu is just a fantastic opposite to her, somebody that is very ganky and energetic and just wants to pull Umika out of that, that rut that she's in and get her out there. And yes, doing the four path, uh, four, forehead path, uh, telepathy through forehead touching. <laughs> it's like forehead to pathity is what they subtitle it. Um, and yes, there's a twinge of Yuri here in the idea that they're it's kind of implied they kind of turn that into the whole kissing thing because they're touching foreheads and then it kind of eventually turns into almost a kissing thing 
Um, but yeah, she always touched her forehead and says that that's her alien ability to read minds. And so they touch heads and they goes, oh, and I don't know exactly what you're feeling. Um, but they have like a great chemistry between the two of them just supporting each other, which I thought was fantastic. Or more so you supporting Umika. There really isn't really many times where Umika is supporting you. So it's a dependency on one side. It's not really a codependency in a lot of regards. Um, then like Haruno, uh, it kind of has Haruno and Matataki kind of being the other pairing because they kind of sort of play off each other as well, where Haruno, Haruno feels like the the sweet flower. Like, she just loves everybody. She, um, Haruno is a really great kind of offset of Umika because Umika wants to leave the planet because she doesn't feel, she feels like a prison here. Whereas Haruno is the type that she would want to invite the aliens down because she'd want to show them what the great things of this world. So they both kind of have opposite viewpoints of Earth and space. And so Haruno kind of seems like the pure, too pure girl that is just a fluffy flower. But then, like, later on, they actually get into that more hidden side of her, the side that is having issues and gets frustrated and has difficulties with her own dreams. And then that kind of plays off well with Matataki, who is mostly about her is just, like, that struggle that she has with of, of succeeding. And she feels like if she doesn't succeed, then she has no worth. And that turn it kind of turned into a, a massive ordeal later on. Yeah, just in the just in like the one episode that I had first met her, she seemed hyper hyper driven. Yeah. But that kind of gets into my difficulty of the show. <laughs> I think it started off really good. I think it was a very strong start. I think it was very sweet. Um, I love the first episodes. Um, just it, it got my heart. You just grabbed it, and it wouldn't let it go. And I loved watching them kind of, you know, build up, get to know each other, go into the models and building the rockets and all that kind of stuff and finding materials and going to the competition. And I think like after that whole competition, I think things started kind of falling apart for me. It just became, it sort of just became not enjoyable. <laughs> like it, it went, it kind of went into the realms of drama which i'm fine with like you know there's a there's a falling out everybody's struggling uh, you know seeing umika and um her ri rival uh the rival person against her kind of coming in and helping her out and giving her a little bit of a talk it kind of was doing fine and then at some point especially with matataki it kind of just started like we're doing this again <laughs> like we had thought we got past this and now we're doing this again and it's heavier this time and it just didn't feel for like, I don't know how long that was. I think it felt like probably half the show. It just didn't feel, it didn't feel like a fun show to watch. It just felt like everything is just kind of depressing and, and everything's kind of overdone. It, it, it went into the realms of what I would categorize melodrama. And that's what kind of ruined it for me. I think it had a fantastic ending. Um, the last episode was really good, but gosh for like a good six episode it just it's the show wasn't enjoyable it just felt like it, it was stuck in a rut for a long long time and i'm probably exaggerating it probably was only like three or four episodes but it felt like five episodes at least that it just didn't feel entertaining and it like i said it just it got way too got way too stuck in the mud and it wasn't really enjoyable and that yes i can argue that when it comes to the shows like this some would call it we categorize it as like a cute girls doing cute cute things that I wouldn't really categorize it cute girls doing cute things they are a cute girls doing a cute thing but I feel like this was trying too much to be a focused story um where it is all about self-discovery and overcoming things it was a lot it's much more slice of life than you typically get from a standard cute girls doing cute things show it wasn't fun <laughs> in that regard like usually with those types of shows you want it to be fun and this was kind of borderlining that and pushing more into the slice of life and into melodrama. So overall, I enjoyed it. I think it had a great style to it. Super cute. Had a lot of great moments in it. It just got stuck in a nasty rut of drama that I felt was a bit much. And then they had this whole segment where it felt like everybody was taking turns doing their, like, I got over my issue. Oh, hey. I got over my issue too. Hey me, I got over my issue too. And it's like, this feels so cheesy. Please just move on. 
<laughs> you don't have to explain that you got over your issue. And this is all after Matsutake joined, or was yeah. it uh, the whole process of getting her to join? <laughs> That's what I mean. That's what I meant earlier when I said we're going back to this. <laughs> we just broke the Sundere, and now we have to break the Sundere again. Um, yeah, just it kind of just went right back into heavy, which sucks because Matataki was like one of my like I just like her because she's Sundere, but it was like oh crap, this is too much. But yeah, start a start us telepath. Sixteen bit sensation. Let's let's do this, Chris. I got a bone to pick. Did you watch the show? No. I got a bone to pick, Chris. 16-bit sensation, another layer. Um, this one was streaming, uh, ran for 13 episodes, done by Studio Silver, based on a manga, sort of. Apparently the manga is a... Not time travel. <laughs> I'll just say that. I do. Re I really badly want to read the, the, the manga, because I think I think the manga is probably what I was wanting, because this wasn't, wasn't what I was wanting. Uh, it's a comedy slice of life. But yeah, this one... It was basically wrote by a group that actually worked for, um, uh, what was the company? It was, um, uh, Aqua Plus. They used to work for Aqua Plus. So it's like the, the original manga is like technically based off of like real experiences in the visual novel world. Because, yes, that plays into the story, which kind of follows Konoha, who is a part of the visual novel world of today, um, which isn't doing particularly well. <laughs> Uh, her the company that she's worked she was she was raised on things like Clonod and Kanon and stuff like that these these Pajojo games that are like about cute girls that have difficulties and they overcome those difficulties and she just loves and adores cute girls and when she gets into the business and actually gets to make them she's an artist when she gets into the business she's stuck making what the company wants to make, which is the only thing they can seem to make that's cheap and easy to throw together and make a quick buck, which is like, you know, uh, mind control app, uh, arrow stuff, like MILF stuff. <laughs> and so she's like, wow, this isn't really the cute Bishojo games that I wanted to make. And she kind of hates it. Um, at some point while she's upset about this whole situation that she's in, um, she's trying to give a couple ideas to her boss and everybody and they keep rejecting it. She's depressed, and she ends up coming across this old, run-down uh, shop that has, like, these, like, steel-wrapped <laughs> mint condition and stuff like that. Stuff in a bargain bin, and it's a bunch of Bishojo games, like Canon and Clanon and stuff like that. And this old lady just, like, has her explain what's so great about them, and she just goes on this big rant about how great Bishojo games are. I think she tells the entire story of, I think it was Canon that she was explaining, or it was Clanon. Uh, but yeah, she leaves the store, goes back to work, and comes back later to thank the old lady, and then kind of find the place is, like, empty. Like, it just got emptied out within an hour, which doesn't make any sense. And so she's like, something's weird here. She goes inside the shop, and she finds this little bag and says, thank you. And there's a a bunch of, like, really nice quality um, old visual novels and stuff inside of it. Well, she goes to pop one of these open, and then it teleports her to the time frame in which that game was made. So she has like all these games in her bag and essentially whatever the creation date of them is essentially like a time machine somewhere else, which comes into play in a minute. She travels back in time to like 1990, I think it was. And she goes back to where the place that she was working, which is now this other visual novel producing company. And they're making a visual novel and she gets her way in there, starts to help them out with making visual novels. And then poof, she goes back and forward in time again. And then she goes, oh, crap, I didn't get to help them finish the game. And then she opens up another one, and then she pops back in time again, and it's kind of forward in time more, and she runs into the same group again, and they're, you know, further in time, and they're making their next game or whatever, and then she helps them out with it again, and poof, back forward in time. And it kind of turns into this back and forth of her going back, being able to create games like she's always wanted to create, create Bishojo games, she has to figure out the tech back then. No, nobody believes that she's traveled back in time, even though she's holding this this iPad up in the air going, I have this. It's this technology from the future. Nobody seems to believe her. Um, she has to learn old technology, technology limits, you know, old days of clicking each pixel one by one and inserting a color into it, doing dithering to give shading and cutting back on your amount of uh, colors you have in a, in a system, like, you know, you have a 16-bit uh, system, and so you're, like, limited to, like, 15 colors or whatever. 
all that stuff kind of plays out coding and the technologies and how the technologies advances as she's just all she desires is to create games the the gist of it kind of turns into okay my initial thoughts i love the show i was like i thought kanaha was just absolutely a bundle of fun she's Literally, Kaguya Sama's say you on steroids. She's just screaming all the time. She's just full enthusiasm. I know some people found her annoying. I found her full of life and enthusiasm. That came across from the say you is this girl that just loves cute girls and bishoujo games, and she just wants to have fun with them. She's, as people say, she's me for real. She, she's her entire room's full of nothing but Anaplex stuff because this is apparently produced by Anaplex. So there's fake go and. Magia record everywhere. Um, but what I what really grabbed me early on was, yes, the, the enthusiasm of Konoha was fantastic and, like I said, infectious. But what really grabbed me early on as well was this idea that it was almost... I think the whole thing is making a statement. The, the From the very beginning, it feels like somebody has something to say about the visual novel industry and just entertainment industry in general. This idea of Konoha wants to, to make the shoujo games and everybody's telling her, but those don't sell anymore. It's all about, you know, it's all about gotcha games and mobile games. All those things are going to mobile games now. All you can really do, you can't make a Bishoujo game and make money anymore, which is really kind of interesting for somebody that, something that's showing so much material from Aniplex, you know, um, they even had like Autry in the background all the time, which is another one of their visual novels. It really felt like they were, the story itself was making a statement against the fact that those things don't sell anymore. It's all about fake grand order. And then, yes, you're seeing in the background, you're seeing fake grand order on billboards and you're seeing at her house, she has magic record pins and stuff like that. And it's like, is this saying something in the idea that, I mean, obviously I don't think it's intentional to say that she goes home and she has pins for a gotcha game because it literally sounds like she does not like gotcha games. She doesn't like that. These gotcha games have taken over from the Bishoujo games that she used to enjoy, which we've we've talked about this before, where it that te- it does make sense. That seems like where all the visual novels are going. If you want to play a visual novel, these game a game these days, they're in mobile games. It play Fate Grand Order. That, that's a visual novel. It's just got a gotcha and a card system battling game at the same time. Play Magia Record. It's a it's a visual novel, but then you're playing this little turn based fighting over here, and you're playing a gotcha. That's where it's all going. I mean, even here recently, visual. Um, Visual arts, key. The ones that made Klanon and Kenon. What is their biggest recent success? A gotcha game. Even key is going to gotcha. All these studios are seeing that's where the money is now, and they're going to that. And it felt like the beginning was a statement to that. She's mad at this. She wants to go back to the day where you're making, you're just making a story about cute girls overcoming, you know, whatever struggle they're dealing with because they fight and they 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 fight through it. That's what I fell in love with at the very beginning. I was like, this felt like this was making a statement. And then she jumps back in time and it's like, okay, now she gets to make the thing that she wants to. And I thought it was going to be a big love letter to technology. Like, yeah, I mean, we have to click to make the colors. And I love seeing that insight into the world of it. And this is the technology, the coding they have to do to put it all together. The bugs they have to deal with. I love that stuff. It was like what I said, I think, in our first impressions. It felt like Shurbako of visual novels. Shurbako is all about showing how animation is done in an entertaining way. This is all about how visual novels are made in an entertainment way. And then it jumps forward in time. And it jumped back in time. And things were a little bit progressed. And I was like, okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll see how things play out now. Maybe they'll show how the industry's kind of changed. They sort of do that. But then it just became about that. And that's where it lost me. Let me just come out and say it. 16-bit sensation, another layer, is easily the biggest, without a doubt, most massive disappointment in a series that I have felt in years. Like, I'm not even holding back now. I was thoroughly disappointed in the show because I loved it back here and I seen so much potential and it just got squashed so badly. Mainly because, like, all the heart that I seen from the very beginning, which was passion, it was about the industry, it was about creating things, it just turned it into business. Which, again, goes to what I said earlier, it felt like this was making a statement, 
it felt like it was making a statement to strictly just the industry and nothing else. There was no heart. There was no no employees. There was no Konoha. There was no uh, the development of the games themselves. It was all just about the business of visual novels and then their weird skewed perspective of where it could go in the future, <laughs> which that got weird. I think the moment that it kind of just kept jumping back and forth between times at some point, I just didn't care anymore. And it, it, I just, it lost all value. It didn't feel like it had an, a thorough line of storytelling. It just felt like, like, you know, some anime do really well where you watch the show and at the very end it has a time jump and you get to see them in the future a little bit like buddy daddies, a little, little time jump. You get to see where they go from there. And it's always kind of a nice thing. This is like that, but the whole show is that. You're just constantly time jump. Oh, so that's where they're at now. Time jump. T oh, okay. I didn't really get its uh, bearings over there, but I guess that's where they're at now. Time jump. <laughs> it's like, can we slow down so I can feel for two seconds how this character is right now? It just felt it just felt like so much of the focus kind of just got ripped out of it from the characters and just handed to again, it was too it was too company focused, it was too business focused and None of that was interesting. Like none of that, none of that had any value. None of it had any heart, and just kind of lost maybe everything. That was the point? Maybe that was the. There was what, the, that. Was the message? That was the message. We will rip the story and the heart out of the storytelling. That way, people go, "Why did this? Why was the heart and the story out of the story?" Because we wanted you to feel what we feel all the time. It was business. <laughs> that was the plot. Um, yeah, and then it gets all weird with the later part. Like, it gets into science fiction crazy stuff. I mean, it was already science fiction to begin with because of time travel, but really weird science fiction stuff. And they did were something they plugging, clever. Were they plugging the, the visual novels into the brain? <laughs> Reverse it, Chris. <laughs> you, got, you got it close, but backwards. Um, they, they even made a statement about AI, which was like, yeah, I guess that was a pretty good statement there. Like, they, they go this whole thing like, okay, now AI can help you with making visual novels. And it was like, and then, of course, they have to make the statement, but it doesn't have any heart because it has no humans included. And they actually kind of did something with that, which was kind of like, okay, that was kind of clever. But yeah, it was just, I at that point, I didn't care anymore. Um, like I said, I really badly want to read the, the manga because the manga, like I said, is not supposed to have a time travel element to it. She just goes to work at the shop. In the back of the shop, there's an Eroge game, Eroge game kind of making station in the back. And she starts helping with that. And there's no time travel. So I'm hoping that's like the story I was looking for, which was, again, just jump back in time once, make games, have fun, and then move on kind of thing. But yeah, it was a, it was a bummer. It was our it was our bummer, but yeah, that's a sixteen bit sensation. Another layer. Overtake. Sorry, Chris, you're going two times in a row. Unless you watch this one, you're like, yes, actually, I watched it. <laughs> I watched your video, and you wouldn't shut up about it. Uh, yeah, Overtake ran for thirteen episodes, done by Troika. Finally, Troika did something besides idol shows. Fantastic. Uh, but yeah, sports genres. Uh, Ayaki is the one that did the directing, which they done pretty much everything. Troika. Um, uh, but yeah, this one opens up with a photographer, Koya, and he has shutter shyness because something traumatic happened in the past, kind of gets a little glimpse of him and, you know, him taking a photo of something, some sort of natural disaster and criticisms and all this kind of stuff for proposing a picture because he didn't help the people he took pictures. Uh, but yeah, they, he gets assigned to take photos of F4 racing, which is apparently getting big for the girls these days. They, he's working for this girls magazine apparently racers are getting really popular with the girls so they want him to go to this f4 place and take fit photos he goes there and eventually meets this one racer named haruka uh, haruka haruka is a part of like a very small team they don't even have much money behind them um whereas mo you have other teams that are like backed by you know it's just a a rich person and he just buys a race car because he wants to race you have over here this big massive corporation has like two racers and like five F4 vehicles at the same time, 50 changes of tires. No, Haruka is like literally they're running the current treads on their only wheels to nothing. They're <laughs> like they're bald. Um, but yeah, he's he he sees how hard Haruka is working and trying and not relying on the people. And it kind of gives Koya like a like a push. Like, I want to try harder because I'm seeing you try harder. And I want to root for you because it, it makes me feel good and all that kind of stuff. And then eventually he sees Haruka lose a race and 
it encourages him to finally take a photo of a person, which he hasn't been able to take a photo of a person in a long time. Like I said, shutter shyness. He's able to take pictures of, like, shoes and fashion and whatnot, but just not a person. So, um, kind of turns into Koya running in there to their place and saying, hey, I want to become a sponsor. And they're like, you do realize how much money it costs to be a sponsor for a, a race car, right? And so he kind of does everything he can to try to find people to support them and, and fund them and get them new tires and all the while just rooting on the sidelines while taking photos and stuff. And it kind of plays into who Haruka is, which is again, the racer, what his, what his dreams are, which essentially is that he's take, he wants, he wants to, he was taking over the same uh, team that his father was a racer in um, something, unfortunately befalled him, but he's been always wanting to get on the podium where his father kind of lifted him up onto the podium at some point when he won. He wants to get up on there on, on his own. It gets into the rival team, which like I said earlier is the one with two racers and five cars each. Getting into them and their struggles, like the the first, they always have like a first and a second. The first person is the, the lead, and he's the one that's always getting the first place, whilst the second always kind of trails him and keeps everybody off of him. Gets into that, that whole kind of dynamic between the two of them. And then later on, getting into Koya and why he actually has Shutter Shyness, which big shock to me was a really good story. <laughs> it was a really good story. Um, but yeah, that's um, that's Overtake story in a nutshell. But yeah, I I really, 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 really love this show. And this kind of goes back to that whole thing where I love Troika for like I'll know a Zero and Recreators. And like I said, they got kind of into the idolish stuff for the longest time. It's which admittedly I never watched, so I don't know if it's actually really good. But this is like them returning back to me actually watching them, and I love pretty much everything they touch. And this is another example of that. I thought this show was absolutely fantastic. Like we always joke about, it, it's kind of like the the sports show that's not really about the sport. <laughs> I mean, there is tons of talk about F4 racing and F1 racing and the slipstreaming and the treads and all this kind of stuff, adjustments they do with these race cars, um, their path to, you know, rising up and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of lingo in there, but it never gets really stuck in it. The races themselves are really good. Uh, the music, they use CGI, obviously, but it's really good CGI. They do really good with the perspective and the um, the viewing distance and everything like that. Um, the music with it kind of just ramps it up, gets you really hyped and all that kind of stuff. But at its heart, it is characters like these characters are just absolutely fantastic i would kind of admit haruka wasn't like the most intriguing character it's just really this is what my father did and i want to do what my father did but like koya and the rival team i think was where like the juicy bits were i think they're those three characters at least those three these those three characters were just absolutely fantastic koya is really the biggest part of it when they finally around like six or seven or eight or episode, I think like that six and onward, I think was like just a nonstop, like great episode after great episode, especially like I said, starting things off with Koya's story, getting into what he's dealing with again, getting into the two rivals. Um, they all kind of played out pretty much the same exact time, but Koya's story was fantastic. Like I said, at, early on, it kind of gives this indication that he has given up taking photos of people because of the criticism. He took a photo during a natural disaster and media baked him and now he's afraid. But no, it got into something so much more. Something that actually has a lot of like, he even brings up like historical examples of something that I was familiar with during the Vietnam War, but I never actually looked into the photographer behind that. And it's not like a one-to-one -one or he's doing or anything, but it does play into some of his mindset with the whole situation. And I thought that stuff was really good because like it was doing a really good job of kind of tying in real world events with what he's dealing with and sort of giving his own perspective to the situation. Something traumatic happened. And is it about the fact that he gets criticized or is it more than that? And they just played that whole scenario out, that whole backstory out so well, it got me extremely emotional, and it was easily, I mean, besides like, some segments in like, Frere and stuff like that, easily like, the best moments um, in this entire season, probably the year 
of, of moments in a in an actual show. It, re- it really got me. Um, but like I said, even with his story kind of being out of the way and then moving on from it, I I I felt I still found like a lot of the stories around the rivals really good. Like I said, the idea of one of them kind of getting out of the picture for a minute, um, being put in first place, and the mo- basically the second place of their of their team getting put in the first place finally, and him finally getting what he wants, and him not being able to handle it, uh, which kind of pushes a lot of growth in him, uh, was really fantastic as well. Just overall, overall, I just really enjoyed it. Visually, it looked fantastic. Um, like I said, besides CGI, and they did good with it, so it doesn't bother me. Um, it was a it was a fantastic series, and I highly, highly recommend it. So, yeah, that's um, Overtake. Highly recommend. So, gush, 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 gush. What else? Boot the Reba. I guess we can wait for Boot the Reba. I think the final episode. Well, we'll see. If we do a third parter and it still hasn't come out yet, because <laughs> what they basically did is, I think some listings were showing that the last episode was supposed to be last Saturday, and I was like, that doesn't make any sense because that's, you know, New Year's week. Japan's like no shows during that time, and sure enough, like when it came around to that Saturday, they left. They put out an announcement saying that the final episode will come in January 2024 or later. That was their announcement. It wasn't like. Oh, by the way, it's gonna it's gonna air on this date. No, it's like January or later, which basically means we don't know. <laughs> Just say we don't know. Um, I can technically review it, but there is technically still one more episode, and I kind of want to watch it. So, uh, Yuzuki Family, did you get a chance to watch Yuzuki Family? No, I didn't. I'll just keep going down the list. Let me get a drink first, though. Um, yeah, I don't know if I was pushing this one on you or not. I was wanting to watch it i just didn't get time it, that was definitely I was, on the list yeah i wasn't sure if i would, i put, was trying to push her or not but um yeah yuzuki family's four sons uh yuzuki chan chi no yon kyodai uh this one uh, streaming on crunchyroll was done by shuka the source is a manga comedy drama slice of life but yeah this one opens up with the yuzuki family's four sons they find out that at some point their parents died, and the eldest, Hayato, decided, you know, I don't really want, like, because all the family's talking about separating them. You know, the aunt's going to take this one, the uncle's going to take this one, these cousins can take this one. Um, he's like, no, I, I, don't want, I don't want them separated. I'm going to take care of them. And so he decides to get a job um, and just kind of, you know, support them himself. So he, he's doing college and doing a job, and at some point just gets a job doing teaching, and he's just running himself ragged, just trying to make sure that they're all taken care of, um, trying to handle everything, all the groceries, all the laundry and everything. And it kind of gets into each one of their lives and what what they dig, think about with their situation itself, loss of their parents, what they think of, um, you know, like Hayato taking too much responsibility upon himself, uh, all that kind of stuff. A lot of, like, Hayato stuff is his struggles with the fact that this is something that he took upon himself and you still, yeah, which I think is one of the more like pretty solid moments in the entire series, acknowledging that a lot of his freedoms and joys of his life is kind of lost because he's technically got this responsibility, um, which I think was very well handled. Um, I love the whole the 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 mother is pretty much like, yep, that happens, but you know what? It doesn't matter because you'll have these great moments, and then it'll, it'll be, make it kind of worth it, kind of thing. So kind of accepts the whole situation um mikato and uh minato which are like the the two that are like really close to each other in age they're like there's basically like in the same year so they're technically the same age but one's like a little bit older than the other one um how mikoto who is technically the older one used to hate minato because when he showed up when he was born all the attention from his mother kind of went to minato and he kind of didn't like that and he kept taking his stuff and breaking his stuff, and he really didn't like him. Um, but kind of showing how that sort of shifted when he realized that, you know, instead of not liking my brother, I want to help my brother and show him the way. He ends up falling in love with his brother, basically. <laughs> and then Gokuto, who is this the sweetest, most adorable kid um, that I just want him to smile forever. Uh, getting more of his perspective and the idea that, like, his brother always having to rush home to meet him there when he gets off the bus and how he doesn't want his brother to always have to worry about him and him and eventually meeting the 
the grumpy, nice old man from across the street that just always wanted to help out the brothers because he knows that they lost their parents and just wanted to do anything he could. But he's an old, he's an old man and doesn't know how to communicate. So he just constantly just stand there staring at him <laughs> the whole segment. Every time they come home, this old man's just staring at them. And then he walks in the house and they're, they're like, is he just waiting for us to slip up so that he'll call like parental services or something like that and come in and take us away or whatever. And no, he's like, no, he just was standing there wanting to say something. Can I help you guys? I, I, it hurts me that you guys are without your parents. He just wanted to help them so bad, but he just couldn't speak out. Uh, it was super sweet, but yeah, that's, that's basically the gist of the, sh the show. Um, they'll get into later on, like the, the whole family across the street, which is Uta, which is Minato's friend, uh, Waka, who ends up becoming Kakuto's friend, uh, their mother, and the old man, which kind of gets in their own stories and everything. So, I adore this show without a doubt. Um, did I? Yeah, I think I put it. Really, I'll just say because you have to watch my video. Um, my top ten of fall. This is really high. I'll just say, wink, wink. It's really high on my list. Um, this is literally the gem of fall 2023 is, is I would, I have to look at the list of all the shows in, um, of 2023, but I would probably say this is probably going to be the, the gem of the year. Like this is the one that the, the memberships of Mal and everything is way too low. And I want everybody in the world to watch it. Um, even though they won't, because it's not a shown in its slice of life. I just, there's nothing about this show that I don't absolutely adore. One, yes, which is a massive admittance for me, there is a strong sense of relatability here. Um, for you don't know, for those that don't know, Chris is my brother, and we have another brother. So I'm just one short of being pretty much <laughs> you know, in line with these guys. It's four brothers, we're three brothers. Um, we used to hate each other's guts at points. We used to try to support each other massively at some points. We used to adore it. We we adore each other. <laughs> I, was almost, I almost slipped out. We used to adore each other, which in any ways we don't. Um, we've had our ups and downs. We've This show, it's like every moment in it, I'm like, I know what he's talking about. Like, I know what he's going through. I know what he's dealing with. I, every single situation they fall into, even with Hayato and his, that whole thing with him, he, essentially at some point, this is one of the best moments of the show. Um, at some point, he goes to a um, Hayato, the eldest. He goes to a um, get together with all of his old classmates, and like a reunion kind of thing. And at some point, they confront him. They ask him like what he's doing, everything like that. And he's and everybody's kind of the girls are kind of interested in him because he's kind of looking pretty good looking. And he just starts blabbing on about all the responsibilities he has for his brothers, and everybody gets disgusted by it and they walk away. Like nobody wants this, is has any interest in him anymore. He's boring. And this hits him, like, everybody's enjoying life. They're all talking about how they want to get together with this person. This These two are kind of hooking up. This guy's got this successful job that he's doing. And it just dawns on him, I'm, I, this is technically my responsibility. But he took it upon himself. And he has his, he ends up getting run into by Saki, which, again, is the, uh, the mother of uh, Uta and Waka. And she takes him out drinking, and she's like, he explain, explains that I feel bad because I feel like... He's literally saying this is a burden. He's realizing this is a burden. He doesn't want to think that. And she says something effective. Like I said, you're going to, yes, as a mother, happens to me all the time. Doesn't change anything. But it all it makes it worth it when you have those moments with them that makes it so special. You're going to have the ups and downs. It's going to be a burden, but there is a reward to it. And that hit me personally on that whole responsibility with the idea of caretaking which we've gone through, there is a sense of, yes, you can admit that this is something that is a burden upon you. It's okay to admit that this is a burden upon you because it, along with it comes the, the aspect that you want to do this because it's special to you. It's something you want to take care of and it's something that will give you value. There's something that you, in your heart, have value to it. You love this person or you want this person to get better or you want this person to be comfortable because they mean something to you. But it's okay to admit that the burden is a very difficult word to say, but it's okay to admit this is taking something from you still because it is taking your time, but there is a value to it. Um, and I thought it was kind of very, I love the fact that she turns and says, yeah, 
Like there's no excusing it. It's not her turning and going, you know, you don't understand. You think it's a burden, but you're actually getting something out of it. No, it's literally, yep. I, I agree. <laughs> it did. That's, that's lot. That's what this come. what comes from this. Um, I thought it was special. And like I said, I, I tell everybody, give the show three episodes because at least you'll get one of each story. Like the very first episode, if I remember correctly, is Hayato, I believe. It's really kind of the introduction. Um, that gets into um, Mikato and Minato, I think, is the second episode. Or maybe they're the third episode. Kakuto, Kakuto was the second. I, don't, I forget which the order was. But I think three episodes pretty much covers like a bit of each of the characters. And I think Mikato, Mikoto and Minato's story, I think, was one of the, the, the most impactful ones early on for me. And that one was just a nice showcasing of how they portrayed storytelling uh, with the two of them and their relationship early on. The way they portrayed the emotion that was building up inside of him, they always kind of show these little squiggly, kind of sketchy art, black and white, of him getting angrier and angrier, um, which kind of shows that balling up and building up to that point where it explodes. And I think it was just like a very beautifully told story. Um, later on, Uta's story, who I thought was really super good, um, broke my heart. There's just there's just so many good stories in here, and and kind of how I put it in my I think my top my top picks video. Or maybe it was in my top of the year. Because it was in both of them. Spoiler. I think the, what, what kind of defines this best for me is... It is a is a story... Was it manga, right? It's a manga. It's a story, whatever. Where I think the writer knows they're talking about. Because these characters don't... I mean, besides like this kind of ongoing joke that Mikoto loves his brother Minato... Like, he super loves him. And there's kind of, like, almost a feeling of, like, every time Minato gets mean to him, he just kind of, he likes it. Um, besides that kind of comical element kind of thrown in there every now and then, these characters don't feel like anime characters. They don't feel like manga characters. They feel like kids just trying to get through their days, having struggles growing up, going through situations, having fun. It feels like real like real kids just trying to make it in life. They don't feel rote. They feel natural. And like I said earlier, they feel relatable. Massively, massively relatable. All right. All right. Big question. Big answer. Mr. Mr. Hayato is obviously the oldest. And I'm supposed to Maybe. relate to him. Maybe. I'm supposed to relate to him. Maybe. So, did when he was growing up, did he always get in trouble because he's the big brother? He's supposed to know better? That's Mikoto's story. I, when, you were, <laughs> when you started opening that up, I was like, I don't really see Hayato in you at all. But Makoto technically does fit into you. And I, But now I don't know if you, like, overly adore your brothers now like he does. <laughs> but, like, literally, I, I think Makoto is y you. Like, if you watch that second or whatever episode, because that's what it... That's what I think was so great about his story was it was the, it was the brother, like I said earlier, it was the brother that... Mom's doting on me because I'm a new kid. I, yes, he has his older brother, his Hayato. But his older brother, Hayato, was old enough that his mom wasn't doting on him anymore. He was getting all of mom's attention. And then suddenly, mom disappears for a while. And then he's like, where's mom at? And then suddenly she shows up and she asks Minato. And now Minato has all the attention. And yes, they do get into that whole idea of when Minato does something to make Mikoto mad. And he turns on Minato. The mom's like, you should know better. Not your older. You you should not do that. You sh you should know better because you're older than he is. And yeah, that was that whole element that was in there. Was I was like, yeah, that's I I never really I never dealt with that, but I now looking back know that was a thing. <laughs> it, it's kind of like those. I, every now and then you have one of those moments where you you just you know you know you get with the mom and you say, I never realized how much of a brat I was because then I just remember this thing that I used to do and I'm like, <laughs> how did you not just kick me out of the house? Um, that stuff. So. Yeah, it's it's super good. I I adored it. the visual style was great too. There was a lot of like really great animation points. I love the character designs. I think it's a very unique style to it that I so absolutely you, adore. So so needless to say, you love this show. <clears throat> I love this show. <laughs> there, you, you get one out of me. You'll get me. You get one out of me this time. No, I really do want to watch this show. I it it is definitely been on my list. It's it's it's. Just a matter of I got to put six hours together to watch it. So I would like you to watch it before the deliberations. Yeah, I mean, Very is there likely. any other shows that I 
that I've been pushing on you to watch. I think this is probably the one that I would probably say. Yeah, I would think that this is the only one out of the entire year that you're probably because you watched Magi Rabo. Yes, you watched Donnie Mai. Um, I wouldn't really push you to. I mean, there's a few of them that I, I probably wouldn't push you to watch. I think this is it. You, go watch my top ten of the year. I did release that, didn't I? Yes, I did. Go watch my top ten of the year. I think I think this is the only one that I think I've been trying to push you to watch. Like there was Heavenly Delusion on there and stuff like that, but I was never pushing you to watch that. I think this is probably the one. So there you go. Yeah, Yuzuki's family's four sons. Absolute much swatch. What about Proko Rain? Did we do that nope. one? This will be a quick. Let's just do this one quickly. <laughs> let's just let's just rip the bandaid off. Uh, just sorry. Say, nope. I'm doing a streak of shows that only Andrew watched. Usually I kind of jump around, but I just want to get them done. Well, most of the most of the ones that I watched were on the last episode, so <laughs> that's true. We did hit quite a lot of them last last episode, but yeah, Protocol Rain or Bokura no Ame Iro Protocol. Uh, streaming on Crunchyroll, done by Quad. Sources original, it's a drama. Uh, it essentially opens up with this guy that is working at a a gamer cafe, and yeah, they, they kind of serve drinks and foods to kids, and they just kind of you know play shooters and stuff like that, third person shooters. You know how you know how Japan is big on PC uh, shooter games, um, very successful. You know they're big on <laughs> esports as well. So there's there's a big esports competition going on as well. This cafe apparently has its own esports team. Kind of find out the manager isn't even paying them. <laughs> they haven't won any games. Uh, they have a big walkout, and so yeah, they come to find out that the the manager of this cafe has got a massive debt, and it's all kind of stemmed around the esports game. And so he really needs to. And yeah, you know, just so happens the esports competition coming up has the same exact money as that he's in debt for. So guess we gotta win this esports game and so he's pretty much recruiting a lot of the people to play with them Shun actually used to play uh, this particular shooter game that they were they're playing a lot when he was younger and um, there's a there's a trauma around the fact that he was playing games too much when he was younger that his sister got injured and he blames himself for it and his sister's like can't even walk anymore so he's like i'll never play a game again and then they're like hey play this game for our esports so we can make money to save our cafe and he's and then nozomi the daughter of the i think it was the daughter of i don't remember uh nozomi's like don't even ask him that because you know what shun gone through he's he's tortured by this and then um he he, he joins anyways but yeah they, they start playing the esports game and and then, yeah, they get a hot. They they recruit people, which one ends up being this hot model slash actress that is actually somebody they know in the past who's disguising themselves as a new gamer. Uh, you have this chunky guy, the otaku dude, that comes in with like all of his crazy otaku skills, and he's got all the you know the he needs like the perfect setting and everything. The he's got the macro. He's 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 the elite guy. And yeah, they they all play the the game. Oh yeah, there was also this guy Akito who's obsessed with his sister. That guy too. They all play the game together and they go to competitions and blah 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 blah. The the th different thread stories is one Mio is heavily reliant on Shun. Mio is his uh, sister that's um, not able to walk anymore. She's heavily reliant on him and super doty on him and constantly wants to be doted on. And then you have. Pretty much all the stuff around you, which is the actress who is hiding her identity from her manager and playing the game. And if anybody finds out that she's actually playing esports, it's going to completely ruin her image, so she won't be an actress anymore. Um, those are the main story threads. Shun being pulled back into the game, even though he didn't want to get involved with it again because he still blames himself for his sister. He gets the attention of this one other rival guy who gets super creepy about him like he wants to pull shun into his side and to give up everything and get delved into the game and become perfect like he is at gaming it and he likes to play butt naked in front of his monitors while talking while thinking about shun um he's creepy <laughs> there's he's two special. he's special like I, I can tell just how special this one is there's two very special characters in this show one is Mutsuki, which again is the guy that's obsessed with Shun and 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 thinks about Shun butt naked in front of his fifteen monitors, trying to get him to get as skilled as he is by giving up everything like he did. 
and then Mio, which is adorable. Mio is adorable, by the way. Uh, Mio, the sister, is extremely adorable. And I want to see hey, her happy. Hey, Andrew. But. Is, is Mio adorable? But. I think Mio and Shun's relationship, like, I, I'm i okay with the whole SISCON thing. Like, I, I've watched a lot of SISCON BroCon shows, but there was something extremely creepy about Mio and Shun's relationship. <laughs> like, I don't know if it was the fact that it was just so poorly animated that it kind of made it creepy feeling. But there is, like, this weird, I, I think it's the, the melodrama later on in the show that I think kind of ruined it for me. Because, like, you'd have this whole sit-down conversation between Shun and Mio, and she's constantly going... I don't want to go to the hospital. Like he starts playing the game to help them with the debts, but then it kind of turns this whole thing where he wants to help Mio go to rehab. He wants to, he's been working at the cafe because he's been trying to help mom with the bills because they lost dad and the sister's cripple. And, and he's doing all this esports things, hoping that he can win the tournament so that he can pay for her rehab. And Mio literally is like, I don't want to go to rehab. I don't want to go to rehab. Cause then, then you'll leave me. I kill the camera. Somehow managed to kill the camera just by talking about SISCON BroCon stuff. <laughs> but he's telling Mio, you're going to go to rehab. And she's like, I don't want to go to rehab. And he's like, but you need to go to rehab because you, you need to get better. No, I don't want to go to rehab. Well, why, do you don't go to, why don't you want to go to rehab? And she wouldn't say it. But you kept seeing these signs where she's like doing everything. Like she's literally crawling everywhere while he's asleep to get his clothes cleaned and perfectly done for him. And get it back to him so she can snuggle up back in bed with him because she just adores him. It's kind of turning into this, like, forced codependency thing. Like, she loves him to death because he's always taking care of her and, and moving her everywhere. And this becomes something that she just doesn't want to be without. Like, she does not want to get better because if she gets better, she can be on her own and then he'll leave. She literally doesn't want to get better because she doesn't want him to leave her. He wants to, she wants to always have him doting on her and taking her everywhere. So it kind of turns like a, like a whole psychological thing, so to speak. And it's cute, but I think it's kind of ruined because you have like these little scenes where the two of them are together and this melodramatic conversation happens. I know this is the second time I'm bringing up melodrama, but two shows this season. It turns like this really weird conversation between the two of them where it's just like, Oh yeah, I'm gonna win so that you can have the the care that you need. Yo, you're bringing that up again. You're not gonna win. I seen you're losing, and it's just like a a stupid, weird conversation. And like I said, that whole thing and the whole you know Mutsuki thing with the whole butt naked monitor talking about Shun. It's just it's weird. And that's not even get into the fact that the show looks so butt ugly. I mean they. They put, like, all their efforts into you, um, the, what was the girl's name in, in Rent-A-Girlfriend? Um, cause she literally, I, I think even somebody mentioned the idea that it's actually technically the same character artist. I'm like, that doesn't, that doesn't shock me at all. You literally looks like the girl from, uh, Rent-A-Girlfriend is like, I think they put most of the effort into making sure that she stays on model, but everybody else looks just so wonky as hell. There's so many perspective shots where it's like, what is happening on the screen right now? You just guys don't care anymore. Like, this is an, this is an original. This is a original story. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's, like, the studio itself, but it's an original story. So you're going to want to hope that it... Usually with original stories, you want to do a really good effort into the show because you're not banking on a source material. Now, I'll probably make a manga or something based on this or something like that. I'm sure it's already in works. But if you want, if you're an original, you're not based on a source material that you're pulling an already established fandom from. You're gonna want the show to look really good. I don't know if maybe they put all their money into having Suwano Hiroyuki do the, the OP or something. Like, where did all the money go to? I mean, they had a good set of seiyus that were kind of involved with this, so it's, maybe that's partly to do with it. But God, it didn't look good. Um, they did. I have to admit, they did a decent job with the game itself. I mean, it looks like a decent looking bog standard arena shooter but i mean it didn't look terrible but there was also the issue where i feel a heavy sense of watching the show that it feels very hello fellow kids and the idea that i don't think this the writers know anything about the esports fear 
uh, there's too many moments where the characters act as if they don't know what the hell they're looking at. And it's like, but you guys have been... The, the, it's a, again, it's an internet cafe, gaming cafe, and these people act as if they've never played these games sometimes because they'll talk about a strategy and they don't know what the hell's going on. It's like, do you guys not play the game? <laughs> like, I thought you guys were like super deep entrenched in this game and now you're all acting as if you don't know what they're talking about. Uh, it's just constantly they'll bring up like these random lingos and they're like, what is that? And they have to explain it. And I'm like, but that's standard stuff that you would know if you were actually a gamer. And so it... Again, it it gives the it gives off too much of that feeling of you're trying to go for an esports anime, but yet all the characters don't seem like they're they know anything about the esports, and yet they know about the esports and the lingo and the strategies, and they're constantly having to overly explain their strategies, which doesn't make any sense because they're standard strategies. It just it feels really off in that regard as well. So I don't know, like through and through, it's just like one of those. I guess E for effort, <laughs> but it's just not a good show in the end. Like it's a very, it's a very rough, very rough show. Like through and through. I think the only thing that kept me going, admittedly, even though I didn't enjoy really any of the show, the only thing that kept me kept me going was just wondering how far they were gonna go with Mio because it just felt like the writers were being super creepy about Mio, and I'm like, how well, is this gonna dethrone Orimo or something? <laughs> And I think it pretty much did because it kind of is just as um, interesting in that regard. I, I don't know, but Mio is adorable. Um, she's just a little too clingy. She's a very she's a very clingy little sister, <laughs> but that does kind of open up the doors to creepiness. Anyways, the OP is amazing. That's it. Just just watch the OP and never watch it. Uh, what else do we have? Um... I'm assuming you didn't watch Firefire Fire, Daigo or Ron Kamenohashi. No. Nope. Uh, Saints Magic Power, did we do that one yet? I don't think we did, did we? Saints Magic. We we have not. And you could talk about that one, right? Yep. <gasps> Look, Chris finally gets to talk about his show. <laughs> the Saints Magic Power is omnipotent second season, running on Crunchyroll for 12 episodes. Uh, done by Dio Media, light novels of source, fantasy, romance, slice of life. And from my understanding, it's caught up with the source material, so I don't think we're ever going to get into this season anytime soon if we do. Uh, but yeah, this one follows uh, Say, whoever, whoever has not actually watched the first season, which shame on you. Um, in the first season, we have Say, who is a office worker. She gets transported to another world, along with this other girl. And... Immediately, when they arrive there, the prince of the kingdom comes storming in after the summoning and literally grabs the other girl, not Say, says, oh, you are the saint that we summoned, come with me, and just rushes off with her. And Say is just kind of standing there going, what the hell's going on? And they're like, uh, sorry, it looks like you got summoned as well, but that was the saint, we got the saint. Can't do anything, I'm sorry, we can't send you back. You're just kind of stuck here. Um, so we'll try to help you have a, a peaceful life here. Just kind of enjoy. And she ends up kind of roaming around and eventually comes to this kind of research botanical area where they do a lot of research and growing herbs and stuff like that. And she gets really interested in that stuff. And that just kind of be that becomes her new life. Like she says, I can't go back home. Um, I'm here now. I kind of like what I'm doing here. So she kind of grows this love of just raising herbs and come to find out that she does have magical powers in this world and she uses it to make uh, different potions and stuff like that uh, ends up finding out that she has a lot of power actually and um, it kind of goes in this whole story in the first season about how yeah the prince was dumb and the prince uh, made a mistake and yeah Say is kind of the one that has the powers uh, she has incredible healing powers and she ends up joining them in essentially doing what the saints do, which the whole purpose of the saint is to go around and cleanse these areas of miasma because miasma grows in areas. Essentially every cycle, there'll come a point where the miasma starts to grow from different points and grows large and monsters spawn from the miasma. They summon a saint, the saint comes in, does their purification to get rid of the miasma and then cut forward, the miasma will come back, they'll summon a new saint and she's the one for this time. So she's going around and helping them clear up all the the miasma. And that's pretty much how the, the first season kind of played out. In the second season, it's getting more into, um, yes, the fact that she's getting a lot of attention from people. They're still trying to keep the fact that she's there a secret. 
Um, she's doing a lot of these really great researches in her potions that gets the attention of this other country. Come to find out that other country has a lot of niceties that she is familiar with, like coffee and rice and all that kind of stuff that she gets super interested in. They open up other, another trading company to sell her stuff. And then there's a massive question mark as to, I, I think the big pinnacle point of this, this particular arc, which I think what makes this second season a nice stopping point for the season, even though it has caught up to the, the, the light novel, it's a really great stopping point because the massive question mark that comes up in the second season is what now? Um, once she fulfills her role, what does she do from that point on? There is the big question mark of once you're no longer really needed as the saint, what then? Who, who, what, where is your life going to go from there? Um, marriage, all that kind of stuff is kind of being brought up. Um, a lot of people are wanting her. <laughs> like a lot of people are sending letters to the kingdom going, Hey, we want to marry her off to our boy or whatever. Um, so they're getting a lot of attention. She's getting a lot of attention from people. So because they finally introduced her to the world or the kingdom, basically. So, yeah. Um, your thoughts or your view. Sorry, this isn't first impressions. <laughs> um, the first the first season I absolutely loved, and the second season I'm not as hot on it as I was in the first season, but I still very much love the show. I I love Say, I love Hawk, I love a lot of the other characters. Um, the it, this this particular section kind of split into I would say what three arcs. Yeah. Um, the first arc being the like Andrew had mentioned the um, the foreign uh, country kind of taking notice of somebody with. Uh, well, a lot of it was her setting up her company, and that kind of led into what leads into the second arc, which is somebody else getting interested or taking note of her, basically. Um, then the second the second arc was kind of a. Um, Finishing the, the finishing the miasma, and then the third arc was kind. Of, well, the second and third okay, arc you're kind of yeah. kind of <laughs> they lead into each other. Yeah, my my point were, was that like the first arc is like her discovering this other location and wanting to look into the ingredients. That leads into the second arc, which is them wanting to find this person that made this potion, and them hiding her away, and that leads into relationships which leads into the miasma which is leads into the final thing so there it's sort of like three arcs that kind of have something that bridge each one of them yeah is what i would put it um but yeah the uh all said and done i guess the miasma was probably the both the kind of the weakest and at the same time it had the most um the most payoff uh and, and yeah I, I, well, I wouldn't say weakest, but yeah, I do agree with the payoff. It, it, it had the a uh, 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 absolutely fantastic payoff. Uh, Did you all... hate that? Like we got that scene at the very beginning, and it was like, wait, what the hell's happening? Yeah. <laughs> and then we don't find out what that was until way later. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, here's this scene. I'm guessing <laughs> because like it, it like opened this this season opened up with like this first episode. The opening scene was like. Whoa, budget went up apparently. This is crazy looking. This is a crazy little dragon fight. And then it's like, what the hell's happening? And then like, wait, what happened to say? And then cut and I'm like, so is this is this after that? Or is this before that? <laughs> it was a little confusing. I'm I'm on the same page as you. First season, loved it to death. Loved that was a beautiful show. Um second season. I was okay with the beginning segment because I was think I was still off that like hype going into the season. Like crap, yes, it's back. I say he's back. I love her personality. I think she is. I, I, I think I mentioned in my uh, tier list uh, live. I was like, say is one of those characters where I feel like there's nothing like no barriers there that I would just love to sit down and just have tea with her. Like she just seems so chill. Like she seems such a likable person. Just sit down and just talk about random things. And I, and I, so I kind of feel for Hawk whenever like he sits down with her and he just enjoys being with her and she kind of gets all caught up in her, her mind and she goes, crap, I'm sorry I brought all that up. And he's like, no, it's fine. Like, I, like, I agree with him. It's like, it's just, I enjoy listening to you talk about something you're passionate about. Um, so like, I was okay with the first part, but first part, it felt like a kind of a get me settled down with the, the crew and then kind of lead into what we're coming into. The second part is where it kind of lost me. It was that whole like hiding her away from the, 
from the prince and all that kind of stuff. And then it all led into the the letters coming in for say and everybody questioning relationships and if if somebody's gonna get with somebody else and it's like it felt like it felt like for a good chunk in the middle there, it felt like it was spinning its wheels. Like I just I get it. Like I understand what you're kind of setting up here, but don't keep chasing your tail here. Like Hawk, like at some point I'm going, Hawk, please dude, do something so we can stop talking about this. Like I was rooting for Hawk to say something because Hawk's a cool dude. Like he's not a deep character. He's just a chill, cool guy. Like he's not a, he's not a dumb, uh, like Prince Charming Ikemen, but he's, he's not like total flat, but he's got just enough personality there that I like. And, and he's charming enough to, say and 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 looks out for her enough that she appreciates him and so there's a cute charming aspect between them but i want to i won't say that hawk is an incredible character um most of my attention's been around say and a lot of the story arcs in the first season were around like um ira and all that kind of stuff um that whole thing with the prince in the first season i thought was absolutely fantastic but this season was like it got stuck in that and I think, like, with the, the miasma and the build-up to the final moment of it, like I said, was a nice closure. It was a super nice closure to the story. Like I said, I felt like this this wrapped things up so well that I'm not like, I need a third season right now. I would like a third season, but I'm not going to, like, crave it and think that this is not – this is this this feels satisfying. But I will admit that, like, a huge chunk of the season, it was like, I just – you you it wasn't there. Like, again, the first season had so many great – character or so many char character moments great story arcs again everything around the other the other uh summoned person and all that kind of stuff with the prince but this season just felt like it was just yeah i love the moment to moment with say and the characters it's always charming i love the chemistry with the characters but it was kind of a it just had a lot of very blah episodes and it was very disappointing because i know like when coming into the season i was super hyped for it not to say this a bad show it's not a bad season. It's just not not to the levels that I was hoping, I guess. Agree? Disagree? Yeah, moderately disagree. Just, it seems like your arcs that you're looking at. I mean, did you like the whole hiding the hiding say kind it of didn't moment? Bother me. I liked the I liked the prince and I thought that that was uh kind of fun seeing her get excited about a lot of that stuff. But the the only thing that kind of bored me was when they started going into the miasma thing that mm -hmm. that was kind of boring because then it it was yes the the kind of marriage proposal things it kind of got more heavy on the marriage proposal things then they went off into the miasma thing and it was like okay let's let's go okay hot got to look cool for a minute um say got lost for a minute um and then then we got back or we we celebrated I did like the the Hawks family thing. That was cute. I liked uh, I liked a lot. Yeah, of I was about that. to ask you. <laughs> um, but then after after that was all said and done, we went back and then we had our our good happy moment and that was it. So I I mean, it, her, it, her in the bath getting flustered. <laughs> yeah, it, it the. the <laughs> It, it literally was okay. The the kind of marriage proposal thing stuff that was starting to build up the miasma stuff that that little section right there is the only part that I was like, "Come on, let's get to a point." It, it just felt like that particular section was dragged out, and it wasn't really all that long. But everything else, I was pretty much enjoying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I still suggest people check out season one, especially if you're looking for like a. Like I, I think with the season one, the biggest comparison we were always giving was the Snow White with the red hair, which Snow White with the red hair is not an isekai, but it's got that similar feeling of like the two of them moving to a new location, getting into herbalism and stuff like that, medicine, and finding a new purpose in life, and, you know, female lead, Prince Charming characters. But I think with, with Snow White the red hair, the male characters were so better wrote, if I remember correctly. Like the prince was super good, a uh, super good character. Again, not that Hawk's a bad character; he's just he's not like super deep. Um, I, I it, no, a lot of the male I, characters in this show are not really all that. that I think the strong. one that like had the most to him was probably Johan, but that was like not that much either. I mean, they were trying to do something with Yuri towards the later part of this season, but it was just the fact that he's a dork. 
<laughs> a magic obsessed dork. I like I like that. Eventually, he's like, yeah, I'm just trying to. You literally know that he's just trying to push. Of course, they were they were getting in. I don't know if he was lying or not, but I mean, it does technically confirm at the very end. They were kind of hinting at this idea that he just finally discovered the the uh, the fuel for the saint's power, which I was like, yeah, that's that's cute, I guess. It's cute. It's cute. Everybody sees it. The, 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 uh, did you did we do playthrough? Did you watch playthrough? Yep. Uh, playthrough of a certain VR MMO life. A dude, a, a certain dude's VR MMO life, or Toru Osan no VR MMO Katsudoku. It gets Katsudoki. Sorry. Uh, ran for twelve episodes. Done by Maho Films. Oh, that's why I didn't watch it. Uh, light novels of source action adventure comedy fantasy. I'm joking. Sort of. Uh, yeah. So it follows a. This dude, I think he's like, what, 30 or something like that. He just plays VR MMO games and just wants to just chill. He's the guy that likes to play solo, even though he plays MMOs. Um, he chose, he chooses all the worst classes and skills because he just wants to be alone. And uh, for some reason, everything that he chooses that's terrible ends up being OP. And uh, it gets the attention of everybody. So how'd you like it? He's the one guy in the world who wants to play solo and yet keeps helping everybody anytime anybody asks. Right. <laughs> he he's like, he's like, he's like the coolest dude in the world, but he doesn't want to have anything to do with anybody. It's, it's the weirdest thing. Um, he's no, a dead, eh? He's a super, he's Sunete. a, he's a, he's a, he's a, beat he's like, the he's, back, a he's, he's, like, he's like a backwards Sunete. He, he like finally, uh, they broke, broke him out of the dead and into the soon. And he went freaking nuts on everybody. Um, it's <laughs> this, this show is, it's goofy and fun. I, don't have a lot to say about it. It, um, I, I did enjoy when when we in, ended up adding the fairy queen and the and the dragon girl a little bit later, but it really doesn't do much of anything special. It, it, it. The, I guess the weird thing about it is the fact that he's keeps choosing all the weird off abilities. And yes, the the fact that they keep becoming OP is kind of sta uh, box standard. But I do like the fact that he is. Uh, specifically going for the um, the underpowered abilities. Um, so it, it's it's just this weird conglomeration of story. Um, the, everything seems really kind of <sighs> just kind of moves the plot along. It doesn't. Nothing is really in particularly deep. So yeah, it's it's about middle of the road. Very actually, kind of lower middle road for me. But I had a lot of fun watching it. There you go. That's a uh, dude's VR MMO game. Uh, did you finish that love with the villainous? Yep. Oh, good. I want to hear your thoughts on this one. Um, Watashi no Oshi wa Okuyaku Rejo. Uh, done by Platinum Vision based on a light novel, comedy, fantasy, romance. And uh, yeah, follows a, a office worker who gets his guy as the protagonist for her favorite Atomi game. And yeah, just so happens... Uh, well, it doesn't so happens uh, just as it usually have it. She absolutely adores the villainous character of the game. So the moment that she realized that she's the protagonist in the game that she's, you know, was playing a lot, she immediately turns to Claire, the villainous, and says, I love you. Daisuke. And just follows her around. Even though she treats her like crap, she's just like, please do that more because I love you, Claire. And Claire's like, leave me alone. And uh, yeah. So what happened after that? And what's your what's your review? I heard a lot of positivity around this thing. Um, I do so like I'm, it. I'm hoping that at some point it does some crazy twist. Um, actually, <laughs> I wouldn't say crazy twist. It does does do a couple of weird kind of things that are um, shifting the way that, um, for instance, when you're when you're playing you're playing the game, you have your four your three or four love interests that you can choose. Well, the way that she's uh, kind of shifting the game is she's forcing, almost forcing the game to um, shift its uh, target towards, obviously, Claire. And it it does actually drop kind of hints here and there that it, hey, it, you're you're forcing this 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 fifth choice, um, and it it actually is really kind of cool how they kind of 
the storylines kind of are deviating in that direction and it really does actually seem to be playing out. And I, I really do like that. Um, even at towards the latter part where it actually is kind of plopping a, an extra character into the story and you're like, okay, well, where did this random character come in out of nowhere? Um, the Ray actually kind of explains that this character is actually does this at a certain point. And it kind of shifts the way that the, the, the game is playing. And it actually makes sense when all is said and done, they, it actually surprisingly plays out and it makes a lot of sense as to what this character was actually doing. And, Oh, Hey, by the way, even though what the character is doing is at odds with what the character normally does, it actually makes sense in the end at the end of the uh the story being all said and done. I really liked it. Um now would I put this at the top of my list? No, not really. Um I think it's really good. There is a a, a sprawl of the kind of the middle area that does kind of get bogged down in um I don't know. It, it really is stuck between Ray constantly complaining to to Claire to get her attention. Claire is constantly antagonized by Ray. Eventually, it does kind of chill out on that. Um, it. I don't know at what point Claire kind of shifts from being mad at Ray all the time to kind of just acknowledging that she kind of i think it's probably when she became the maid that, um, that's what it felt like just before i stopped watching it was like they had this whole scene where they're in the room together and she was like why do you even why do you say that you love me why do you love me that much and it felt like there was a understanding that was kind of building from that conversation so my assumption would be that that would clear up after that if they weren't just wanting to kill it which it, they were already at that point doing that it, it seemed like, I mean, it doesn't go away completely. It just kind of chills. And eventually you, you get this kind of, um, after she becomes the mage, it seems to kind of chill out. Then there is a moment that we will say a character leaves that, um, it kind of, there kind of becomes this, um, acknowledgement of um warmness between the two of them and then then you add the the that character that i had mentioned earlier which is flat out sparks are flying everywhere and we are understanding that there is warmness and then whatever have you at the end warmness 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 but yeah warm. i like the show all said and done, I I I do I do like that I kind of stuck with it. Um, it it like I said, it was a little bit rough for a couple of, a few episodes in the middle there, but I did end up enjoying it. All said and done, there you go. Chris is in love with the villainous. I am. Dessa what? Uh, Kingdoms of Ruin. Did we do that one? I have no. Uh. Uh. I no. I don't want to oh, touch I this was, thing. I was just asking if we did that. No, already. don't force me to t watch the show. Did you watch it? No. Okay, I was just, I was wondering if you're like playing into saying that you watched it. I'm like, wait, what'd you do? Who 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 took your dog hostage and told you to watch it while I wasn't looking? Uh, yeah, the Kingdom of the Ruin. I seen Hametsu, the first five minutes. Hametsu no Okoku. There's not, nothing really happens in the first few minutes, so I don't know, I know. what bothers you. <laughs> Like you actually you no, know, like I, I like all I know is on all I know is I have up. these I have these images that Andrew has made me think about and and I don't want to watch it. I know, no. Oh, the not. the cheese, uh, turning the girl into a cheese with all the holes in it, something like that. Um, yeah. Anyways, uh, based off a of manga, action, drama, fantasy, edgy is the genres. Um, yeah, this one this one opens up with uh, Adonis and he's traveling around with Chloe. We kind of find out the history of this world, the gods, uh, the gods based or god or goddess, whatever. Um, some being created mankind, and then they created the witches, and wanted the witches to basically guide the humans, um, take care of them, you know, keep them safe, and show them what to do. At some point, mankind decided to rise up because they create technology. They don't they don't need the witches no more, so they they just just don't want them anymore. And then you have this one 
king that shows up and he starts basically ordering everybody to hunt down all the witches. We got we we can't just like not be under their thumb no more. We just got to get rid of them completely. Uh, they create like this whole machine that can actually stop the magic from being used, and they just start killing them all. Just the witch hunts happened. And uh, I know this is traveling around with Chloe, who is a witch, and she has raised him. Kind of find out at some point she even was kicked out of like where the witches were because she wanted to raise Anodis and train him how to use magic and take care of him. So they didn't like that because she was teaching a human how to do magic. He can't use he can't, he can't use magic like witches do, but he can use this special pin that allows him to write out the magic so he can use the magic. And she's taught him how to do that. And he's been traveling around with her, and they keep getting hunted down. Eventually, suddenly, the they finally locate where Chloe is, and they transport her back to where the king is currently at in front of her, his audience. And he has them all executed. Th throws Ananus in jail because Chloe, like, begs for Ananus to be spared. So he gets thrown in jail, locked up. Cut forward many years later, and this Doraka girl is, along with this other girl, chained up being sold um they kind of get a sense of like even though all the witches are gone they gotten rid of their their big enemy there's still like just nastiness in the world which is human trafficking and Doraka somehow manages to steal the phone from the prison leader and is able to mimic his voice on the 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 voice recognition to unlock all the jail cells which i think is a massive flaw in their security but it releases everybody, including Adonis. Adonis goes out to get his revenge and starts gunning down people in the middle of the streets in the metropolis. Uh, says that everybody is guilty for Chloe's death. And then uh, he dies. And then kind of find out he was actually transported to the moon where the witches are at. Where they're trying to... They have the last witch tree that births the witches. And they want him to transfer his remembering of Chloe to one of the birth apples from the tree that will make Chloe come back and then they all get slaughtered and then everybody just dies um yeah so it's it's Adonis getting his revenge for the death of Chloe and he hates everybody um I don't really at the end of it all don't really care or remember what the hell his whole purpose is but he just doesn't like anybody he wants everybody dead and the entire time, the Stodaka girl's following him around, saying that he should stop wanting everybody dead. Um, I'm not sure. I don't even remember at the end of the, of the story what she even wants, but she's just following him around because I don't know why. I, don't, I guess she just had nowhere else to go, so she just follows him around, and tells him to stop being mean. Uh, I think she likes him. Um, I'm guessing he she likes him. That's why she's following him everywhere, even though he's killing everybody. Um, not like she has anywhere to return to, but. Uh, there's a evil witch at some point that they're they get turned on to and I, I'm guessing that's his current focus. I that would be his current focus right now. He probably wants her dead. So they're going after her. Oh, he hates the evil witches too? No, there's a there's this there's this idol witch that's taken over the kingdom and she So he uh, hates her debut. idol witches. Huh? He hates idol witches and evil witches and humans and this idol witches. witch. Be well, he doesn't hate idol witches. It's just that this this particular witch is currently taking over the kingdom, and her debut was a literal idol debut, where she went on a stage in an idol outfit and danced and sung for everybody, and everybody liked it. And then she likes to do her jogs on the side of the road, and everybody freaks out and screams and everything because she's an idol. Um, and he hates her, but he doesn't know that she's an idol. He's just he. She was talking to somebody else, and that guy mentioned this queen and that's her. So it's not necessarily that has anything to do with the fact that she's an idol, but Adonis just hates everybody, so that's not <laughs> that's a mute point. I'm just saying, I think that's his current focus. It seemed like his focus for most of it is just been, I want to kill everybody, except for Doraka. I don't know why. He just, for some reason, never kills her. But he wants everybody dead. Um, and like I said, Does he want to kill Chloe? Um... <laughs> <laughs> he does technically kill her in a sense. There you go. Question mark. There you go. He had the opportunity to unkill her, and he didn't. Is there that is that killing? If you un if you don't if you don't undead somebody, I don't know. You could you have the That's possibility of undeathing I, them, I, I, and you don't do it. Is that death? I, is I that want, killing? I, that that 
would that be something that undead because they would have been alive undead, undead and luck could actually kind of play into no yeah no i don't i don't get your logic there <laughs> um anyways this show it doesn't look the greatest but it's not the worst uh visually um I'm of two minds of the series. On one end, it's like, a, it's a, it kind of falls in the train wreck area where you kind of just want to watch it because it's so like, what will they do next? Like, it's so edgy. You're just waiting to see what stupid thing they'll do next. And it often kind of involves what stupid things the characters will do. I was making a big joke early on where there's this like setting where you have all these people around this tree. And this other group comes in and everybody's everybody in this area wants everybody dead. Dorica is somewhere in there going, please stop killing each other. And everybody's just getting ripped to shreds. Um, there's this dude taking out this big whip and just literally slicing everybody in the radius in half. And she's literally still there going, please don't kill the guy. Just cut everybody in half because I want to stop fighting. Um, but it's like one of those moments where you're like, I keep seeing everybody in the area dying, and yet people are still standing. Where are these people coming from? Like, every time this happens, you assume everybody's dead. But then, for some reason, there's still five people standing. Um, it's just, it's so, it's so, like, edgy to the point where it's just over the edge. Like, th this isn't an edgy show. This is literally off the cliff. And I kind of like it for that. Like, there is a side of me that's like, I like a show that's willing to say I'm going to be as dark and gritty and bloody as possible and not hold anything back. Like it is, this isn't sugarcoated anyways. I think the only sugarcoating they put in the show is why is Dorica still alive? <laughs> because they faked off her death like 15 freaking times. Um, it just girls got so only much 12 plot armor. Only 12 episodes and she's died 15 times. That's Literally, impressive. yes. Like, like multiple times per episode. And then you have a couple episodes where it's only once. I mean, there was one episode where she didn't die. So there's another one you have to add to another episode. But, uh, there's a lot of fake outs. But the, for the most part, it's like this show is just super dark and edgy and violent. And it doesn't really care. Um, which I, again, I, I kind of give it some credit for doing that. Its biggest problem really is in Adonis. Adonis is a, just a very... He's a very unfocused character, I guess is the best way to put it. Like, his, his character writing is so flip-flop, it's not even funny. Like, like I said before, it just feels like early on, I want everybody dead. And then it's like, but not this person. And then it's, then I'm going to let these people live. And then it's, I don't care about you. But then it's, I don't care about anybody. And I want everybody dead. It's like, kind of make up your mind, like, what you're going to do with this character. I, I, I understood the moment that Dorica came into the picture. I'm like, this is going to be the character that's going to have to be his, his balance. She's going to be his suppressor. That was perfectly obvious from the very beginning. Dorica is going to be his suppressor. You can't have, I, I didn't see it being 12 episodes plus of, plus question mark, of just Adonis slaughtering everybody that he looks at. There's got to be somebody there to kind of reel him in, and I knew that was going to be the case for her. But I think she also kind of turned... She didn't turn into as annoying as I thought she would be, because I thought she was going to be just absolutely obnoxious. I don't get her logic a lot of the time, because like I said before, you have a guy that's literally killing everybody, and she's saying, don't kill that person who's killing everybody, when in fact, not stopping him allows him to kill much more people, and you're seeing that happen while you're saying don't kill him, um, that frustration kind of comes in the picture. But that's usually the case with, like, massively passive characters. They are passive to the point where it's more um, more detrimental to the the greater whole, um, which happens in a lot of stories. Like I said, I mean, there's a there's an entire story arc in one of the Gundams that's, like, really... There's several of them that do that. <laughs> there's several Gundams that do that. But, um... Yeah, she she wasn't as annoying as I thought it was, she would be, but she's she definitely got some massive plot armor. That's that's for darn sure. They did sort of open the door to some interesting mechanic between Anonis and Dorica later on, which I kind of was seeing coming from a mile away. And there's a tie-in with Dorica to somebody else, which I seen a mile away. 
So there is like plot lines they have opened up towards a later part, um, which kind of expands the world a bit more because, which is refreshing because my earlier, my earlier enjoyment of the show wasn't around Adonis and Dorica, despite the fact that I liked the fact that it wasn't holding anything back. My enjoyment early on was that I found the world to be kind of interesting. I like the concept of the witches. I like the concept of the humans. Um, this idea of the witches technically being created to guide the humans. The humans rise up, kill the witches. And then they come to find out, oh yeah, by the way, the witches are technically necessary for the environment. Because without the witches, the environment is dying. So it's this idea of mankind destroying all the witches. But then realizing very quickly, we oops, we kind of need them. But we're not going to talk about that anymore because we already did it. <laughs> Like there's this whole thing about this whole magic device they were this this de scientific device they were using to stop the magic, and they were saying like early on they could use the device, and they didn't find out until like years later that it was actually causing the those that use the device to die, and then they just collapse dead later on, and they realized oh yeah it's because of this device, well now when they use it and you're near it it literally kills you pretty quickly because the witches they were their magic was keeping the environment stable and without that stability because all the witches are gone now it just literally kills people so there is kind of an interesting kind of mechanic there like i said there's some stuff that can come into play later on with dorica and adonis that does fascinate me about the mechanics and the magic and stuff in the world that i would like to see more of but yeah um Overall, it's it's a decent show. I, in the end, I, I thought it was a decent show. It, it, every episode's just kind of like a, what did I just watch? Um, this is stupid, but it's still interesting at the same time. Like, it's edgy to the point where it's just kind of stupid, but I still enjoy it. Um, so, I don't know. I don't think we got another season announced for it. I don't think it'll get another season, but I'd welcome it. It was It was fine. So... But no, I'm not even gonna. I'm not even gonna bother joking and saying, Chris, you should watch it because it's so incredible. <laughs> yeah, there's one point where this character just literally gets her eyes just like smashed in by thumbs, and it's like, <laughs> these floating hands are flying around, grabs this character, and smashes their eyes in with their thumbs. Cut episode. Next episode opens up. Um, Adonis. I can't see. <laughs> yeah. I would think so. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. Let's see your eyeballs shut with these flaming hands. Like the jets from the back of those flaming hands that just poked your eyes out. Smash the the, 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 the project, you know, like the, the back of the hands got like these like um, like jets that shoot out like flames to make it fly around and he just shoves those back ends of the hands into her eye sockets to see if he could like solder them shut and he pulls them away and they're like perfectly like like there's no like char marks all over her face where the flames were hitting her eye sockets it's just literally like a perfect <laughs> perfect <laughs> like they just sewed up the eyes like it just looks perfect like I don't think that's how her eye sockets would look if he shoved those flames into her eyes. You should watch it, Chris. <laughs> She's sitting on top of her. <laughs> oh, it's perfect. Thank you. I'll fix your eyes later. <laughs> By the way, I can't see. Tear Moon de Sawa. Um, you watched Tear Moon de Sawa, right? Oh, of course. Tear Moon, Tear Moon Empire. Uh, Tiramun Tekoku Monogatari Dan Todai Kara Hajimaru. This one uh, ran for 12 episodes, done by Studio Silverlink. I think it was on Crunchyroll. Light novels of source, drama, fantasy, romance. And yeah, this one opens up with, um, what was it? Mi 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 Minya Tiramu? Yeah, Mi 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 Minya Tiramu. Mew. Anyways, now Mia Timrun, and she is the princess of this kingdom, and yeah, she was overthrown, and they took her to the guillotine and chopped her head off. Um, she was a bad princess, and they, they took her down. Bad taxes, they were destroying the kingdom, she was self-indulgent, she was cruel, 
So they uprose and got rid of her. Uh, once the guillotine comes down, she wakes up in her 10 year old, uh, 12 year old self, and she's not dead. And she's got her diary, and she's like, wow, that was a weird dream. And then she opens it, but she sees a diary sitting there, and it's covered in blood. It was a diary that she had with her when she got executed. And then she realizes the diary pretty much lays out her whole life up until the point that she got killed. And she's like, okay, I'm going to do everything in my power to not get my head cut off again. So I'm going to see if I can undo some of this stuff. It kind of turns this whole thing where Mia is, over time, avoiding flags, avoiding people mostly. Avoiding most of the people that were involved in her death. And just trying to just avoid things. Unlike most of these types of stories where it's like a villainous is embodied, like a, a Japanese kid gets put into the villainous body. This is literally the princess herself getting a second chance at life. And what comes with that is the fact that Mia is still <laughs> extremely selfish and she just doesn't want to die. And so she's kind of doing everything in her power to stop that. She does kind of recognize certain things like, oh yeah, this is this this maid that was literally the only people that used to visit me, the only person that used to visit me back when I was in prison before I got executed. And so she immediately takes on this maid and says, I'm going to take care of you. You're going to be my personal maid. Follow me around, all that kind of stuff. Uh, she goes to see the, this finance guy to kind of get him on board with her so that she, he can help her with the finances and get the finances good for the kingdom. Um, she looks into this whole famine that happened, this disease, opens up a hospital in this like you know, low, low provish area, all these little things that she's doing in order to appease certain people that were her enemy. And like I said, avoiding certain princes and stuff that end up getting her killed, uh, eventually goes after this second prince of this one kingdom, um, Abel, and then starts kind of using him as a way of not getting anywhere near this other <laughs> prince of s sunk land <laughs> and ends up kind of liking being around that second prince. So that kind of spurs up something there. So, yeah, just her avoiding flags, avoiding getting her head chopped up, chopped up, chopped off, all the while just mostly everybody just completely misunderstanding her her intentions. <laughs> like, there's two stories that's told in this. Um, Tiramun Empire is two stories. There's a story that's in the head of Mia Tiramun, and there's the story in everybody else's head. <laughs> I like that kind of thing. So, yeah, your your thoughts, your review. Well, Desuwa. No, Sorry, I, Desuwa. I forgot to I forgot to finish up my. That, sense, that's all that needs to be said about Desuwa. this is Desuwa. But if you gotta drag some out of me, I love this show. It absolutely is brilliant. Mia is is fantastic. The entire cast generally all kind of um, works well with her. She's she she has a fantastic ability to. Uh, uh, to just kind of <laughs> make every situation just perfect. Um, like Andrew say, said, uh, her being just selfish is, is just kind of her trait. She, she gets this lost uh, look every once in a while when somebody's talking something super serious to her and she's like not following what's going on, but then she says something and everybody takes it as, the, the the way that should be done and and they think that she's the one that came up with the idea and so they they keep calling her the wisdom of the empire and she's like what is this wisdom of the empire <laughs> yeah like this one moment where like there's this really serious uh, conversation in this room and she's literally like oh cookies <laughs> like no it has this whole like like information dump between these two people um this prince and this other guy and there's a long information dump about what's happening in this kingdom and then it goes, they came to an understanding of with uh, of each other's intentions. And then it goes, it, uh, in, in other news, over here, and it, show, it cuts over to Mia, who's in the same room, sitting down on the couch, and she's grabbing cookies off this plate. And she's been <laughs> doing it the entire conversation. And, and this prince over here is like, I nearly lost myself. Or you know, he, he says something like, I wonder what Mia thinks of this situation. He turns to her, and she's going, ah, oh, um, he's like, oh, good. I nearly lost myself. Like he, he takes her doing that as just like calm down, dude. <laughs> when it's not, <laughs> she just literally wants to eat the cookies. Um, yeah, like I said, it's literally two stories. It is what's in me, Nia Mia's Tiramun's head, what she's saying, and then what people get from what she says. 
um, which I think is fantastic. Like the whole stupid thing about her kicking the tree was like, okay, come on. Dude. <laughs> There's, there is times where the miss, this is literally the whole show is misunderstanding, by the way. Um, that's like the, the biggest joke that the show has is misunderstanding what Mia wants and what she's intending. And that was like, oh, she kicked the tree because she wanted to help me get my car, my, my men out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. All right. Whatever, dude. Um, yeah, it's. Well, and I, and I think that that's, that's kind of, um, there's, I, I've played games where it seems like they do stupid things off the wall and it's like. It doesn't make any sense, but hey, it works, and they tell the story around this stupid thing. Why can't they do it in a show? I don't see why not. It works here, and it and it makes for some fantastic comedy in this show. It absolutely, I absolutely love. Yeah, the, the, the shampoo was. The, yeah, the shampoo was fantastic. I mean, I love the shampoo why the they keep not? bringing it up too, and like your hair is so great. Yeah, I got this great shampoo from Apple. It's literally shampoo for horse. It's even got decorations of a horse on the top. He knew that I like horses, so he's got the horses on the top of the box. No, it's because it's really expensive shampoo for horses. He just no. They they like literally connected through horses. So he he's like, I bet she would love to take care of a horse. I hope she'll take care good care of her horse until we see each other again. It's like, here's here's some shampoo for your horse. She's like, oh great, you got me shampoo. Uh, it was so good. I, I I I got a massive kick out of the shampoo thing. I was kind of behind a little bit, and so like I knew that when I was texting Chris, I was kind of like way late to the game. But like I was like, I just, I have to text Chris about the stupid shampoo thing. <laughs> Use it later on with thinking yeah. that she wet herself. Poor thing. Uh, on new, on knows, on knows her her princess. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I really, really love this show. It's just, it's so freaking charming. I, it just oozes, me at Tear Moon just oozes the whole show. Like, there's a decent, there's actually surprisingly a lot to a lot of the characters. I mean, like, On, her sister, um, Sunk, uh, Sunkland, the Prince of Sunkland, uh, like I said, Abel. All the characters have, like, something to them. Now, granted, most of their character is around how they, how they view Mia Tirmoon, in a sense, they they are technically still sort of um, gravitated around her and their logic and their thinking, what they do. But there is, you know, a sense of justice that, like, you know, um, Sion has versus what Abel has. Um, Sion being the prince of uh, Sunkland, they they have like their own sense of justice that de does technically come to a story beat later on. But for the most part, they're around Mia, which is fine for me because. I do really like Mia's character. The other ones kind of just accent her with their their chemistry. Mia is the bread and butter here, but bread and butter here because, like I said early on, what makes her so great is the fact that, unlike this, isn't a villainous isekai. It's obviously not an Atome game, but it does technically have that same idea of the princess that screwed up and gets killed. Or the the villainous the villain character of the the world that gets killed, but it is not an isekai where somebody comes in and just goes, oh well, I know all the flags, so I don't do the flags, and then I'll survive, and then I'll be happy in this world. No, it's Mia going, I screwed up. Here's my second chance, so let me just not die. But it's not like it's not like a light switch. Suddenly, she is a good person. She's still selfish, and she's still. She's still in her own mind, just um, constantly thinking about what would benefit her. But I did like the fact that they sort of don't – It that's not it. I do like the fact that over time, you do see that she appreciates the things that she's gaining. She likes things like, like, like Abel. At first, it was like Abel is this person to get me away from Sion. But then over time, it's – I kind of liked my time with Abel. And so I kind of want to do this thing for him. So can you help me do this good thing for him for this kind of this tournament, whatever? And she she op she openly enjoys her time around Abel. And the thing with On, normally she would not care about her servants, but suddenly she she wants to do something for the maid. Um, the, the, one of the first scenes is I spent 
was it like five years? She spent like a long time as a prisoner before she was executed. And she didn't have anything but moldy bread and rotten tomatoes. And then suddenly she's eating this soup and it's super incredible. And she's, she suddenly wants to know about it. the ingredient that she absolutely despised. In yeah. The and she time. liked it that time because it was actually cooked properly. <laughs> it wasn't just rotting tomatoes sitting on a plate. Um, she appreciates a lot of things. And I do like that fact that you do see like, she's not heartless. It's just that she, she does have a selfish side and she is self-serving in a lot of regards. Um, but I like those little, I like those little hints of her technically enjoying something and gravitating to something. These little brief moments where you do see that she calls out for somebody like the, this later climax part of the series, you, I noticed it jumped out at me out of nowhere where suddenly Mia's yelling, please stop. And it's like, but it's not showing her inner dialogue going, I want this instead. She's saying she doesn't want this to happen. So it, it does kind of show that over time. Not that I would expect it in a story like this, but there is development happening in her character, and I do like that. I do appreciate, despite the fact that mostly it's a fun comedy about this selfish princess and her inner dialogue about how she just wants to avoid flags and uh, just wants to get out. Of the, just I don't want to be here. <laughs> like like most of the time, it's like something serious happening. Cut to Mia's mind. I don't want to be here. <laughs> I, can I go somewhere else? Hey, we have to stop the rebellion. You're going towards there? You're going to kill you, idiots. Let's just get out of here. Um, it's constantly like, why are we even going this direction? Hey, so you really want to go here? N no, but I'm going to get dragged into it anyways, aren't I? Um, she's a blast. Mia is easily like one of my favorite characters of this of this season. Um, she's a spitfire. She's a fantastic main character. Like, I put her up in the realms of somebody like... Um, the girl from um, 80,000 Gold. Just a, a female lead that I just... I have so much fun watching. She's an absolute spitfire. The Desuaz, I, I I think it numbered... N it numbered in the at least the, the thousands, I would just, I'd imagine. She said Desuaz, I think, about a thousand times. Mm, I don't know about that. Did she break a thousand? You don't think so? Uh, too many times? Yeah, well, you, you I mean, you, you have figure to count the OP. Least... I mean, at least 20 per episode, you the, you're only getting it around tw 200, roughly. You're getting 20 in the OP alone. This is true. <laughs> Desuwa, 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 Desuwa. I don't know Desuwa. if we can count. I don't know that if we can, part, I don't know if we can count the, the, the OP, though, but if you, <laughs> you do, count I said OP, each episode. And then, you never. Then we're, then oh, wait, we're wait, in wait, the 400 wait, area. Wait. You're not telling me you skipped the OP. But you got to remember. No, 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 no. Okay, no, all right, all right. I'm, I, say, I'm, I'm just saying, I, if we're going wait, to count that, wait, we're gonna, if we're gonna going to count that because you you got to figure. Okay, twenty minutes. That's one decibel per minute. Okay, one decibel <laughs> per minute is twenty decibels <laughs> instead of beats per minute. It's decibels per minute. <laughs> so what's your what's your decibel per minute? What? You, what, what? Okay, yeah, you're twenty decibels in the in the in the entire show. Okay, if we're giving that, and then twenty ep deaths was in the in the in the oh, OP, then I you're know at what happened. forty. Okay, forty times twelve is four hundred and eighty. There was a lot of lines where I played it out, and I I just did a little back button press just so I can hear to say it again. That's oh, probably gotcha. what happened to me. There we go. The gotcha. the whole like flubbing the speech thing was great. <laughs> I was telling Chris, like I mean I think I've been joke already. Is this the Minya Tir Tir Mu? <laughs> No, the, the the whole thing where they turn to Mia in that that same room discussion and they turn to her and they, they're like, they needed her. No, it was the next day and she rushed in there and they said that what they're going to do. And she literally like had her moment to say something impressive. And it was literally like, uh, just yeah, or something like that. She completely flubbed her words. It was so cute. Um, yeah, she's great. I, I love, I love Mia Tier Moon. She's, she's fantastic. So, all right. I, I guess, I guess we'll call it there. Um, so that'll just leave one more part. Cause I think we have like, uh, nine or 10 more to do. Um, we'll do our mid seasons for Ferrer and Apothecary. So I'm sure that'll be exciting for people to hear our thoughts on it so far. Well, at least hear Chris's thoughts because it's literally the two shows I'm covering on a weekly basis. So people are probably sick of hearing me talk about them. Um, we talked about it in our spoiler talk. We had some fun spoiler talk about those, those two shows in our spoiler talk. Um, so that'll be, that'll be good. But anyways, uh, we hope you guys enjoyed this set of reviews for the fall 2023 anime season. Um, once we do the final parter of our reviews, we're going right into our deliberations, aren't we? Are you ready for those? 
I have to. I'm not. Ready. <laughs> the better questions, Andrew. Are you ready for that? Because I don't think I've even. I haven't even set up the the spreadsheet. I I I don't know that we can do it this weekend, but it it would have to be almost on a Monday that I'm I'm not working at the shelter. So. Um. Well, it wouldn't be next week because next week's review, and then the following. You're saying the following week after that, it would not be good. No, that would be the better week. Okay, yeah. Because... It rolls. It works out fine then. Perfect. So it literally, it, like, what, what you're saying is it has to happen on that week. We're not doing anything else. Otherwise, yeah, <laughs> I have to wait two more weeks is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that'll, that'll be fun. Um, I, I think the way that I've been doing it with the spreadsheet has been helping us not take... We used, We had at one point we were doing literally like eight plus hours worth of recording and so with the with the breakdown beforehand it helps out so <laughs> um yeah well that that should work out good so we'll we'll see the deliberations and i think after that i think we'll be wrapping up our dis, our community picks for the best of 2023 so i will have ira on again we'll see if chris can join us that time i'm not sure if chris will be available whenever he's available it's like a juggle with getting both Chris and Ira at the same time. I think last time I ended up just doing it solo with Ira, and I gave like, Chris a week off or something like that. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see if uh, what availabilities look like there, and that'll well, be a lot of fun. Well, last year I was I was pretty much working my butt off, so yeah, that's probably what has happened there. So yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what that turns out to be. Uh, but it'll be, it'll be a lot of fun. But. Yep, that's that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed this this reviews podcast. As you as like I said before, uh, talkyspirit.com. That's where all of our links are. Social media links, ways to get a hold of us, Discord links, uh, ways to support the channel through Patreon, tips links, all that kind of stuff. If you're watching this on YouTube, definitely make sure to go down below, hit a like there, leave a comment. Uh, we also become a member of the channel or do a super thanks. Greatly appreciate everybody that supports the channel monetarily and all of your kind words. It means so much to us. But until the next, I, I always want to say my Shuka Mondays. Till next episode, y'all take care. Os. <laughs> every time, every time I just look over. Os. Yuki. Os. Mouse. Boom. <laughs>